on the WTO reforms that can address this, uh, implementing the investment restrictions Congress put in place last year to address China, and then the 301 uh, section case, the issue you're dealing with right now, it will take, this is the first comprehensive approach I've seen, and, and the one I think holds the most likelihood for success. I think as people look at what is a successful win for America, you ought to really focus, as you just mentioned, on the Section 301 area, where you really pull back the curtain on, on China's uh, trade practices and predatory trade practices, laid out that case. I know at home in Texas, we have one of our best corporate citizens, Huntsman Corporation, nearly 1,000 employees in my district. They're an example of how American companies have no recourse when their intellectual property rights are violated in China because provincial Chinese courts simply don't uphold the rule of law. Not only did the court throw out this patent uh, uh, intellectual property case um, based on the expiration date of the die, they appointed a court panel to review the case that had an employee of the company that stole the intellectual property. It, it is that hard for businesses to compete. So let's talk about 301 a second. Uh, a sec I think these are the key issues here. Uh, that'll define, I think, our success. You mentioned this earlier. Will the agreement that you're negotiating with China uh, have measurable commitments in them? Uh, will they be enforceable at all levels of China's governance? Because we know the play they've run before is to, you know, pretend uh, to protect intellectual property at the central government level, but not at the provincial or local court and communities levels. And finally, will there be an avenue for corrective action if China doesn't live up to its commitments in what we hope will be an agreement uh, here in the, the near future? So measurable, enforceable at all levels of governance and corrective action, make sure they live by those commitments. So, uh, you know, thank you, um, Mr. Brady, I appreciate that. First of all, in terms of what is successful, you know, I've been doing this a long time, but nonetheless, over the course of the last few months, I went to every statement that business groups have made, that, that agriculture groups have made, that labor unions have made, that members have made, most of them myself, in some cases having my immediate staff go through and tell me, tell me what that guy or that woman said is essential to a successful conclusion. That, and that is my guide. I'm taking that and I'm distilling that down. And it's, I could, I mean, some of you it's one thing, some of you it's another, but it's, it's all right in a band, right? And, and so that's what I am measuring myself by, and that's what I have as my, as, as my objective. It's not just what I think, it's what everybody, I'm, I'm just, I've distilled down what the people who have spent time thinking about this think. So uh, the, the Huntsman example is like, unfortunately, one of many, many thousands. Unfortunately. And, and I could go on and on about that, I won't, because I only have 12 seconds or 10 seconds to go. So number one, yes, clearly it has to be specific, measurable. It has to be enforceable at all levels of government. Some things are, are, are not appropriate for that, but 99% the core stuff is all, and in the agreement it will say central, sub-central, local, and controlled agents. So it's gotta be across the board like that, and we have to have the ability to take proportional action unilaterally to make sure that we have um, that we have uh, um, a situation where they're following their contract. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Brady. The chair would now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Lewis, to inquire. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and ranking member for holding this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for being here. I've said it uh, before, and I will say it again. There's no way to compete in a race to the bottom. Like our friend and colleague, uh, Ms. Sewell, I grew up in, uh, in Alabama. She grew up in the big city, but I grew up in rural Alabama. And I watched American jobs disappear throughout my life and career. In my home state of Georgia, many manufacturers, workers continue to struggle and find good, livable wage jobs. Over the years, many of those businesses move overseas in search of cheap labor 
and low environmental protection. What I witnessed in our community inspired me to oppose Granite China permanent normal trade relationship almost 20 years ago. At the same time, my congressional district is also home to a large number of manufacturers, both large and small, who rely on aluminum. I do not need to tell you, Mr. Ambassador, that China plays by its own rules and focuses on the loan game. While we may differ on the tactics, everyone in this room will agree that we need a level playing field, and, and we don't have it. We can do better. We can do much better. As you know, Mr. Ambassador, this is not an easy matter. We must be thoughtful, we must be mindful, and we must get it right. Now, Mr. Ambassador, I want to thank you again for being here, and thank you for your service. The current negotiation focus on a number of issues. I want to know whether labor and environment protection are on and part of the discussion. So I would say, first of all, the, the, the principal reason why I'm spending my time doing this now is for the same reason that, that you just stated. That is to say, we have lost, not all just to China, but since China joined the, the, the WTO, we've lost five million uh, manufacturing jobs and millions of additional jobs. And, and that it, it would distress me if that was the result of economic forces but it's not the result of economic forces, it's the result of state capitalism. So I am motivated by the same thing uh, that you are, um, and I want to be judged by that, right? I want to ultimately be judged by that. On the Illumin question, you're completely right. We have a problem, a global problem in aluminum precisely because China doesn't operate on an economic system. They have created through um, controlling their market access and subsidies and other practices, an extraordinary amount of excess capacity that has basically uh, wiped out the, the, the aluminum industry uh, across the world. The, the issues that we are focusing on um, in this negotiation are not, I mean, they are labor and environment to the extent those are unfair trade practices. Um, but it's not the same as we are, as you know well, in the in USMCA, where those are specific objectives that we are that that we are requiring change in. So, to the extent there are unfair trade practices, I'd say also we are constrained by the you know, by the limits of 301 and by the by the statute that we have to work with. But but those are also, as you know well, high priorities for me. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Nunes is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Recognized. Thank you. Ambassador, thanks for being here. And I want to congratulate you for really being the first, being part of the first administration in 20 years of complaining about China to actually do something. Uh, I associate myself with a lot of the comments that Mr. Lewis made. Uh, and I know, it's, I know it's tough because I know the Chinese are trying to be very targeted in the and how the tariffs uh, are being implemented on our side. But I can tell you that uh, from the intelligence angle that we've been studying here in the Congress for several years, you know, the Chinese have moved into taking over the communication systems around the world. They've moved into building strategic military locations around the globe, and those are spreading. At the same time, they've targeted major industries for either takeover through acquisition of banks, energy sectors, uh, and others around the globe in every continent, including, including here uh, in the United States. So I'd like to give you an opportunity, uh, Ambassador, to get into a little bit of how the, they, the Chinese use the regulatory angle uh, to encourage abuse and theft of intellectual property. Uh, because it's not something that I think a lot of Americans understand, but, but they are actively, on a daily basis, basis stealing intellectual property uh, from right here in the United States and transferring that uh, to China to compete directly uh, with our companies and our allies' companies around the globe. I'll give you an opportunity to expand on that. 
but yeah, thank you very much, Congressman. Um, so, number one, I think that the U.S. has the best technology in the world. It's probably our single biggest um, uh, competitive advantage and why we'll be number one for a long time if we protect our intellectual property. Because it's not just a question of high-tech industries. It's steel. It's, it's, it's these combines. If you get into a modern combine, it's like a you know, like a spaceship was in the 60s, right? These, these, you know, how they, how they drive these things. They know they have all these computer operations and satellite operations. So technology is our biggest advantage and it runs absolutely across every part of our economy. It is the, it is the, the key and that's why the president had me focus on it right here. And I think China, as you suggest, knows full well that it's the key. Technology is what's gonna determine who rules the future. Chinese practices are, you could break them down into twofold. One is what they do there, and the other is what they do here. Um, we have, we are negotiating provisions that will, uh, if enforced, uh, um, restate, make far more specific, and clarify uh, commitments against cyber theft, against physical theft, and against using investment practices to get technology. Um, what happens now, uh, I don't wanna go through a lot of specific examples and I know you know far more of them than I do because uh, this is part of your responsibility in, in the Intelligence Committee. But, but what, what happens very often is China comes in, for example, they invest in a, in a, um, in a, in a company, the company develops technology, that technology ends up in China and it could end up through investment, it could end up through cyber theft, it could end up through employees working for that company and then leaving and going to China. I mean, there's a whole group of things, and what we're trying to do is deal with that as much as we can in one agreement. Uh, and then that's one side of the problem, it's the one you're focused in. The whole other side is how they get technology from us through non-economic means in China. U.S. companies operating there, and that's a, that's another thing that we're trying to deal with in this. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Nunez. Gentleman from Texas is recognized, Mr. Doggett. Thank you, Ambassador. I think our country is fortunate that you're on the front lines of this uh, very important negotiation. I did note with interest the exchange you had with the president last Friday uh, that this ongoing negotiation with China is a trade agreement. That's the goal and not a memorandum of understanding. Uh, and I think you indicated that since he's the boss, uh, you agree with him and that your goal is to negotiate and complete a reasonable trade agreement. Is that right? I'm gonna elaborate on that when it's my turn to talk. Well, uh, I'm just uh, referring to your precise words last Friday that uh, you would no longer use the term memorandum of understanding and that this is a trade agreement. Pardon, I, I think of you turn your microphone up. We're having trouble hearing you, Mr. Ambassador. Yeah, and could you pause my time here? It's... No. Is that better now? Yes. yes. Okay. Ah, Thank you. See how easy that is. I actually felt pretty good when you couldn't hear me either for a minute. <laughs> I felt like this is finally, there's finally a fair system here. There will be, there will be, I'm not quite sure I know, um, Congressman Doggett, what, what, where you're going on this, but th this will be a binding agreement. I should take a step back and say to the extent any agreement between nations is binding, right? I always have to make that clear. There's a great, uh, a great uh, de Gaulle quote which is that agreements between nations, I'll slightly change it for, to update it to the current situation, agreements between nations like flowers and children last while they last. Right, and it's, so and, it's a binding trade agreement, uh, a contract as the president referred to it, and as a binding trade agreement, given the statutory authority that you and, and the president have to negotiate, that's delegated by Congress, can you outline to us what you would anticipate after the agreement would be the timetable for submitting it to Congress for approval. 
Thank you. We have no intentions of submitting it to Congress. Well, if, it's, but, if it's a trade agreement uh, under Section 103, uh, you're required to submit it to Congress, are you not? It is. It's an executive agreement. We're not well, required to a, submit it to Congress. We'll have to is, have is, this debate at some point. The president has the, I'm sorry, Congressman. Uh, uh, so, yeah, as you've agreed with the, pr the president, it is a binding trade agreement that you're seeking. You can seek it only through delegation of congressional authority. Uh, and you're required to submit such agreements back if you're lowering U.S. tariffs, which would appear to be the case. Well, let me just say that, that, that we are no way, this is a settlement of a 301 action. It's the, the president is using his power under Section 301, which has been delegated, and it's an executive agreement, which the Constitution gives the president the right to enter into. We're not changing any tariff lines. We're not using TPA, and if we did, by the way, I wouldn't be here now anyway because we wouldn't have gone through the process. So this is not a TPP process. This is a settlement of a 301 uh, action, and it's the president's constitutional authority to enter into executive agreements. Since uh, we may not agree on that, let me ask you if you do agree that unless you get meaningful structural changes to address the stealing of our intellectual property and the other issues uh, that are out there structurally that you outline in your testimony, if all we get is uh, the sale of a few more soybeans and other products, then this is an agreement not worth having, isn't it? Yeah, I couldn't hear the last I'm caveat. Just, I'm just saying the gold here is meaningful structural changes, and if we don't get them, this is an agreement not worth having. I, I, I agree completely with that statement, and right now and, we're 500. And let me just add how important part, it is given, uh, and I realize this is not in your direct jurisdiction, but I agree with uh, my Texas Senator John Cornyn and the others who express concern about Huawei and its national security threat. And if there's any bargaining away of our national security to get this agreement, uh, it would be uh, with great harm to our country. Thank you. So, uh, let me just say, one, I, as, uh, I agree with you on 50% of the things, and that's a, you get to the Hall of Fame if that's you progress. do That's progress. Yeah, that's <laughs> the, well, no, we're usually at 90%. But, but, but I do not think it should just be a purchase agreement. I agree with that completely. And the law enforcement provisions are outside of my purview. I have nothing to do with them. Thank you. The chair would recognize Mr. Buchanan to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this important hearing. I also want to thank the ambassador for reaching out really to both sides. I know you've had a lot of meetings. You've got a lot more meetings you're going to do. So I appreciate you doing that on a bipartisan basis. I also want to just echo what many of my colleagues have said in terms of enforcement. Um, my experience, I happened to be in Beijing 20 years ago as a part of the U.S. Chamber and a delegation there. Uh, intellectual properties was a big issue back 20 years ago uh, in terms of the theft. Uh, and I'm not sure how far there hasn't been any or much progress on that. It's still, as you know, a big challenge. And the thought is whether the agreement's 150 pages or 1,000 pages, what I've learned in my business career, the agreement's only as good as the two parties involved. So I just want to go on record uh, also concerned about the enforcement. I'm for free trade, but it's got to be fair, and we've got to level the playing field. Uh, I want to switch gears to I touched base with you the other day, but it's a big issue in Florida and I think across the country, fentanyl. Uh, last year, 77 percent increase in deaths in Florida. China is one of the leading sources for fentanyl. I know the, uh, the president has had some discussions, and I think he said he had some commitments. Can you maybe expound on where that's at in terms of fentanyl and the Chinese uh, ability to produce that and what we're trying to do as a part of this document, ideally? Yeah, well, thank you, Congressman. First of all, the, you're right, there's a long history of, uh, of failure by China to, to protect intellectual property. The, the first kind of modern example of it was, was uh, a 301 that was brought in, the, in 1991 during the George Herbert Walker Bush administration and, and, and then in the, between 2010 to, the, to 2016, there were 10 different commitments where they agreed to do certain things, which, which commitments I would suggest are, are not, uh, were not lived up to and therefore enforcement really is the, the biggest sort of thing. The president completely agrees with you on the issue of fentanyl. He specifically raised it with President Xi when, when we were in Buenos Aires at the dinner. President Xi, once again, I don't want to suggest that, that, that uh, this is my area of expertise because it isn't, um, but, but agreed that, that he would um, treat it as whatever the equivalent of a controlled substance is in China. 
uh, and, and this is something that the president views himself as having a commitment on. It may very well be something that we end up writing into this agreement, but it clearly is something the president views himself as having a commitment on and that we are monitoring to see if there, in fact, are changes. Very important to the country uh, for all the reasons that you said. I even made a veiled uh, allusion to it in my opening statement, this idea of fighting op opioids is, a, is as important as job training. Let me add, add one other thing I just want to put on your radar. I know you've got a lot of things on your radar, but the ag community in Florida, forestry, uh, a couple of years ago did $8.4 billion. It's a big industry in our state. And in terms of exports to China, that's dried up for various reasons. We can talk about that at a later date. I just want to make sure that's something you're considering or looking at as well as part of the agreement. No, I am. I am. I actually have, I have a... I have a list of specific issues that have been raised by members um, that are appropriate for the agreement and it's something that we have, we have raised and, and will continue to raise. Thank you and I yield back. We recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Thompson. To thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding the hearing. Ambassador, thank you for being here. And thank you for your willingness to work with us and meet with us. You've been very open and very helpful uh, during your time in, in this spot. I have three issues. You've heard from me on a couple of them before. Uh, I'd just like to uh, reiterate those and, and raise one new one uh, uh, to you and, um, and then let you respond uh, accordingly. Uh, as you know, uh, my district produces the finest wine in the world, and China is the largest and the fastest growing wine uh, marketplace in the world. Uh, the uh, 232 and 301 tariffs uh, put a 39% uh, tariff on, on our product, and we're having to compete with other New World wine areas, uh, Australia and Chile, with zero uh, tariff. So I, I just, I'd like some assurance that you're doing everything you can to ensure that high value added specialty crop products have the enhanced uh, uh, entrance or enhanced access uh, to the market. I know you're working on all agricultural uh, issues and, 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 and products. And then the other ag issue is uh, rice. You know, milled rice in uh, California has been waiting for the promised access uh, to the Chinese market ever since China joined the WTO. And, uh, and they've been very, very helpful, as you know, and, and very understanding. And I guess I, I, I'd like to have some idea as to how much longer they're going to have to wait or whether or not we're close to the promised uh, access. And then the new, uh, the, the new issue that um, I, I want to raise today is the, uh, the, are the tariffs on building and construction materials. Uh, the National Home Builders suggest that these tariffs equal about a billion dollar uh, worth of tax on residential uh, construction. And as you know, affordable housing, the lack of affordable housing is something that impacts all of our districts, every district in, in, in the country. And this just makes it harder uh, to be able to build homes and get people into homes. And in my district in particular, uh, we just went through a just terrific uh, horrific uh, uh, fire where we lost about 7,000 homes and homeowners are trying to rebuild and they've seen the cost of building materials coupled with the shortage of supply and the shortage of labor just drive the cost of replacement uh, to a point where they can't rebuild uh, the home that they lost in their fire. And then we've had, there's 7,000 homes in my district, and then the new fires up in uh, the northern part of the state and uh, in Congressman Mamalfa's uh, area and down in the southern part of the state, there's thousands more. And this is really uh, a setback for homeowners who've already been through a lot. And so I'm, I'm just wondering is, is that $1 billion uh, tax uh, really the best way to hold China accountable, and, and I concur that, you know, we need to hold them accountable, but is this the best way to do it at the expense of uh, people who are trying to move into their, rebuild and move into their homes? So, so thank you, Congressman. I would say, first of all, on, on the wine issue, and as you call them high value add, especially crops, yes, they're, they're very important. We, this negotiation, as we have all said, is about structural change, structural change, and enforcement, but it is important that we have 
purchases because the purchases will be good for specific people and it'll also uh, it'll also get the deficit down which I think is an important thing to do directionally for sure and and in that context we very much talk about about um, high value added specialty crops and wine of course is a high is a is a great example of one I mean the United, there's it is a product where the United States makes the best products in the world so that I would I would I can attest to that personally. <laughs> the second thing is rice is complicated, all right. First of all, we have, we are talking about rice in the context of the purchases, number one. Number two, as you know, we have WTO cases, which we have, is the second one public yet? No? Well, we have one that we've won and one that is, is in the process that it'll become uh, public at some point. Um, so, Trying to resolve those in the context of this agreement is something that we are trying to do. So that is something that we have raised. But as you know, rice is a funny issue in China. It's not, it's a, it has a different uh, um, uh, a, a political um, context than a lot of these other things we're talking about. But nonetheless, we're trying to do that. In terms of the billion dollars, I don't know the letter. I should look at it. I presume they're talking about softwood lumber, which I would say is a a, um, a, a, a litigation matter, an ADCVD matter, and I, and I presume also steel and aluminum. I presume those are the things they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I would assume that. And 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 each of them has their own context. I would say, uh, softwood lumber is is a is a litigation thing that we have to work our way through. Steel and aluminum. My objective, as many members know, is to try to work out something with Mexico and Canada on those things. But but I but, we, we've but, run out of time. But uh, thank you. Any information you can get back to me. All right, I'm sorry. That. Thank, thank you. you. Now that we've established that California produces the best wine in the world, the chair would recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, <laughs> Mr. Smith, to inquire. Thank I you, want Mr. to say Oregon, and there are some other states that also have very good wine. I want to recognize. Maybe even maybe Georgia. I don't know. <laughs> and, and the Nebraska wine industry is coming right along as well. Thank you, Ambassador, uh, for joining us this morning. I appreciate uh, that certainly you're dealing with a, a lot of issues, and uh, we appreciate that you take the time to be here uh, this morning. Uh, President Trump has time and again expressed his concerns for our farmers and ranchers. He has certainly made the National Farm Bureau Federation annual conference and, and annual event on his schedule. He's been steadfast in his insistence that agriculture be a part of any negotiations we undertake with the European Union. For this and much more, the rural community is, is appreciative. There are many long-term issues to be considered in the China negotiations, including intellectual property issues, barriers to biotech products, and many other non-tariff trade barriers. However, I do want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the fact that uh, commodity prices are down and the breadbasket uh, of the world, being America, uh, has been negatively impacted by the cumulative impacts uh, of the tariffs and certainly non-tariff trade barriers as well. We should never lose sight of this fact in our deliberations. Because it is so crucial, these talks come to a successful conclusion. I'm grateful for the President's personal involvement. I, along with many members of this committee, asked last summer that the President engage directly with President Xi to move these talks forward. I urge him to continue to do so and that you remember the sacrifices being made by our producers, ag producers, in your daily discussions. In addition to China, we need to continue to move forward with USMCA. We need to bring down the 232 tariffs on Canada and Mexico and eliminate the retaliation our producers continue to endure in order to facilitate the agreement's approval. I'm grateful for the progress made in the Japan talks. Every day our producers face tariff rates higher than their competitors when doing business in Japan it is a lost opportunity to expand and defend uh, their market share. So once again, a time is of the essence. With the President's commitment to U.S. agriculture in mind, uh, I would appreciate your thoughts on the 232 tariffs on Canada and Mexico, and also your outlook for the uh, Japan negotiations. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Congressman. First of all, in the context of China, it's not just about purchases. We have, we had many, many hours of discussion about a whole variety of issues of which I won't go through because most members, well, most members would have at least some interest from biotechnology to, to specific issues uh, in, involving beef, poultry, uh, aquatics, meats. I mean, it's just like you go through it all, a lot on rice, I mean, beyond the purchase, a lot on just the, the, the SPS issues. So we spent a lot of time on there. We actually had uh, uh, long discussions on ractopamine, for those of you who are from the 
the beef producing areas with the vice premier of China. So it was pretty detailed discussion. So having said that, to sort of jump ahead, um, I want to go to Japan very soon. The date's probably going to be in the next month. I want to have a trilateral meeting there on this issue of China with these, and I also want to start our negotiations, which we've now, remember we've gone through the process of TPA with everyone, uh, with the Congress, and now we're beyond our 90 days, so we can start the actual negotiating. We feel a certain urgency, be, a, a real urgency, because of the combination of uh, market access from TPP in Europe in, in this sort of thing you alluded to, and it's going to have a real effect on our um, on our farmers, so it's something that we feel very strongly about on uh, Canada and, and Mexico. In the context of maintaining the integrity of the steel and aluminum program, we want very, work, very much to work out an agreement with, with Canada and Mexico, and we're in the process of doing that. Whether we'll succeed or not, I don't know, but it certainly is my hope that, that we'll do that. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for your candor over the last uh, several days. Uh, my question, and I hope to give you as much time as we can to answer, is uh, we all, I think you can sense up here, the bipartisan nature of our concern as it relates to, to China. Uh, and so my question would be pretty straightforward. How will you define success in our meeting from China and with a specific focus from the standpoint of a number of us here on both labor standards and environmental standards, and how will that play into whether or not you feel uh, the pending negotiations will be successful? Thank you, Congressman. I would say um, uh, what we are doing and what we have to remind ourselves in this context is settling a 301 case. So how I would define success, and once again, I'll try to repeat what I said before, I really went through and tried to distill what everyone else, members, business groups, farm groups, but also experts, people who actually study these things. And for me, um, success is, is number one, enforceable. Number two, um, real rules on forced technology transfer at every level of government, as, as Mr. Brady said, which is absolutely essential. Intellectual, minimum intellectual property, uh, uh, requirements. So once again, this section is is probably going to be, if we have an agreement, the IP section alone will be about 27 or 28 pages. The, the, it's going to be, this is long detail, but every one of you would say, oh yes, that's what I would expect normal IP protection to be, right? In other words, I'm not inventing anything at all. We have a series of, 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 of items involving services. There are specific um, uh, uh, provisions that China has that keep us out of banking, out of electronic payment, out of a whole variety of things like that. And we, uh, on many of those, we've made substantial progress, and I would, I would consider that to be. An, another chapter, I would say, will be non-tariff barriers, and this is literally how we negotiated this thing, non-tariff barriers. What's a big non-tariff barrier? That is these subsidies, these industrial subsidies that have the effect uh, which have the effect of making it possible for our people not only to compete in many cases in China, but to compete around the world. So that's another thing. There's a whole lot of things that we expect to gather on, on, on agriculture, and I, I kind of went through it on that, and we have made progress on a number of those. One thing that we haven't mentioned is we are negotiating currency restraints. A lot of members, uh, a lot of members are very concerned about currency manipulation, and having access to the information that allows you to make a combination. So that's a, that is another part of, of, of these negotiations. Um, and, I'm, and to be honest, there actually are more, and I could m make it even more detailed. But to me, that's how I am going to, uh, to determine whether or not this is a, a trade agreement. Now, keep in mind, it's not like an FTA in the sense that we're going in there and going across the board. What we're going in there is focusing on what was raised by, for the most part, what was raised by our 301. And if we do all of those things, and the speaker said this, and it's not enforceable, and it's, she said it in the context of USMCA, and it's not enforceable, and then it's not very valuable. So we have to have it be enforceable, and that I think it will be for the first time. I think we will have an enforceable agreement. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Marchant, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
uh, Ambassador Lighthouser, uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the district that I represent, but uh, when you land at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, you're in the middle of my district. It's the headquarters, uh, the, head, the national headquarters for Toyota, ExxonMobil, uh, Fleur, Kimberly Clark, et cetera. So I have a, a district that the businesses and major employers in my district are very vitally interested in what you are doing and uh, deeply appreciate uh, your hard work on behalf of the country. Uh, DFW Airport is basically uh, facilitates 30, uh, 35 billion dollars worth of trade. Uh, and the chair, uh, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Brady, has an airport of similar stature in his district. So, uh, to us in Texas, uh, our ports are not only Houston, but our ports are the are the airports, and. Uh, because of that, uh, trade is very vitally inter uh, important in my district. I have a letter here from our governor, Greg Abbott, uh, that is a full-throated support uh, of your negotiations. And um, I would like to put that in the record, Mr. Chairman, uh, in, in that it is... It is a uh, support of your work on the USMCA, and um, he recognizes the importance of that, and we would like to make sure that uh, this goes in the record and, and make sure that he, he, that you know that he is in full support of the work that you're doing. Because I have such a uh, interest in my district, uh, when I go to town hall meetings, what what will, am I going to be able to tell my constituents that is being accomplished in the China uh, agreements and the China discussions that will be very important that, that gets changed for my district? So, so thank you, Congressman. First of all, I've spent a lot of time at DFW, and if, if, if that entire airport is in your district, you've got a very large district. <laughs> because I think that airport is bigger than some districts in the, that members have. It's the biggest thing I've ever seen. So, and I appreciate very much the governor's support and hopefully your support for USMCA. Um, it's, if USMCA doesn't pass, I've said this before, it would be a catastrophe across the country, but it would particularly be a catastrophe in Texas. It's just, I mean, it's just, it, w it would be, um, very bad on every level, way beyond economics, right? I mean, you, and you know what I'm talking about, and I won't dwell on that, but I'm very appreciative of the, and the president's very appreciative of the governors. So when I, when I look at this, and this is not just your district, I don't know if you have, uh, you, you must have a big district if it's got that airport in it, but if you have um, any agricultural products, there will be a, a substantial increase uh, in those and a substantial reduction in barriers. But I would say, when I talk to members generally, the most important single thing that we're going to do is stop the, the non-economic transfer of technology. The technology really is what separates us from the rest of the world. And it is for me, and I think this is true in most, it is for me what's going to ensure that our kids have the kind of jobs that, that, that we had and, and, and better jobs, jobs that we want them to have. If we end up losing that technological edge where we are number two in technology, then, then the world's going to look very different for, 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 our, for our children. And that literally is what I think is had in mind. I could talk about the various specific provisions, but if we make headway to stop this, this transfer of technology and this unfair trade by this trading partner, it, it's going to have a huge impact in terms of jobs and, 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 and high-end jobs in America. Thank you for the work you're doing, Ambassador. Thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the Trade Subcommittee Chairman, Mr. Blumenauer, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, I think you've got one of the toughest jobs in the administration, and we appreciate your being here. We appreciate your openness and candor and discussions you've had with me and so many members uh, of the committee on both sides of the aisle. Uh, frankly, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the 301 tariffs as kind of a 
blunt instrument, uh, attacks on everyday Americans and most businesses. Um, and I am concerned that we have some sort of agreement that results just in purchasing soybeans and airplanes. That's not sustainable. Uh, I'm hopeful that this effort that you've been involved with and in using the tariffs and the negotiations results in some structural changes in order to be termed a success. And I, I'm confident that is your goal as well. Any meaningful deal, I feel, must effectively deal with another long-term problem that has been vexing us for the last couple decades, currency manipulation. The President made a campaign promise that he would have the Treasury Secretary label China a currency manipulator on day one of his presidency. Well, I'm not so much concerned about that broken promise uh, as I am uh, whether or not uh, we're moving forward. It doesn't appear as though China has been actually manipulating in the last 25 months. I'm concerned whether the administration is focusing on ensuring China commits to transparency regarding its currency practices, addressing potential that China will resume aggressive um, currency um, manipulation damaging our economy. In the past, you've testified before this committee regarding the detrimental impact of current, uh, Chinese currency manipulation on our economy and manufacturing in particular. You've even called for the United States to change our trade remedy laws and bring a WTO case against it. I have four questions. Um, it's, it's been claimed that there is already a deal reached on currency. Is that true? If so, can you tell us anything about the substance of that agreement? In the past, I've made a point in my support for trade agreements that we need to ha have our trading partners commit to stronger worker protections, environmental standards, currency disciplines, and that the commitments to be meaningful. Are you seeking enforceable currency commitments from China? And last but not least, if you see indications that China is manipulating, what will the United States to do? Um, does enforcement mean more across the board tariffs? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I, I, I would say, as you say, I have, as currency uh, problems is something that I've spent a fair amount of my time, not necessarily in my current job, but in previous jobs worrying about. And I would also say that it's not just a problem with China. It's a problem with a lot of other areas in Asia. And a reasonable case can be made that it's, it has at times been a serious problem with Japan. And I know those of you who are in the automobile industry realize that. It was a substantial problem, and we lost a lot of jobs because of that. But also some other areas. I don't want to name any other countries, but it has been a problem from time to time. So it's something we have to focus on. There are costs in being the, the reserve currency, but one of them can't be that we lose that you know the good people who go to work every day and have a competitive job lose their jobs. So it's something we have to focus on. In here, in, is there agreement? There's no agreement on anything until there's agreement on everything. You know that from how these things work. But the reality is that we have spent a lot of time on currency. And, and it'll be enforceable, um, the, the agreement will be enforceable, and I think there'll be something on it. But I'll talk, I'll talk to you offline. Yeah, I would appreciate yeah. that. The chair would recognize the gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Wolarski, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Leiheiser, for being here today. Mr. Chairman, I ask permission to insert into the record a letter signed by over 150 trade associations asking for a federal register notice that formally delays the increase of the list three tariffs from 10 percent to 25 percent. Without objection. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, great to see you again. Always glad to have you here. When can we expect that federal register notice? So the, uh, oh, the, uh, the federal, what, what, the, that federal register notice is being worked on right now. The president's made the decision, and, and it's, it's sort of in process. In the next in the next day or so, the president has made that decision. He's made the announcement, and it'll. We're following the legal process. We have a process where we go through. We have a TPSC process, as you know. We right. deal with other agencies, and there are certain steps we have to go to. But that's that. That is something that will happen, and it'll happen, in, you know, according to the normal course. 
And with that, when do you anticipate releasing more decisions for exclusion requests from list one or two of the 301 tariffs? So we're in the process of doing that right now. Um, and those were, in the first place, we've, we've already granted more than 1,000 or, or almost 1,000, as you know. And, and, and things were sort of slowed down because of the, the government closure. But we are in the process of doing that right now. We expect, we expect another sort of tranche to come out fairly soon. Mr. Chairman, I ask permission to insert into the record a letter my, uh, myself and my friend, Mr. Kyan led that was signed by 167 of our colleagues asking for an exclusion process for list three of the 301 tariffs. Mr. Chairman. Without objection. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, there's obviously great support in Congress for an exclusion process for List 3, and we've chatted about it, and I appreciate that. In fact, the most recent spending bill instructed USTR to establish a process within 30 days. We're almost halfway to that deadline. Do you expect to meet that 30-day deadline? Oh, Mr. Chairman, I can't hear you. Can you get that Ambassador, microphone, thank Mr. You. Ambassador? Thank you. I would say, first of all, that that that, that was a report from the Appropriations Committee. Um, I understand that there are uh, people in Congress who want us uh, to have a, a, an exclusion process. Um, uh, it's something that we're looking at. Um, our, our view till now has been that we would have an exclusion process for the $50 billion, which was at 25 percent, the 10 percent, which is what you're referring to in this case, that there would not be an exclusion process. I would note that uh, since the date that we put that into place, there's been a seven or an eight, depending on when you stop, uh, uh, devaluation of the Chinese currency. So the, the, the effect has been um, less significant than, than, than fully 10 percent on those, on those people are affected. And our hope is that we can deal with this in the context of our, uh, of our negotiations with the with the Chinese. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just, um, I, I also appreciate, I know you and I chatted the uh, constraints on resources, and I understand that, that you're facing with this exclusion process. I recognize that the process for list one and two is tough to administer, and I know it's moving slowly, and that list three is kind of looming out there at four times the size, and, and um, I understand that as well. But can I just ask you this in the close here? Is there a way to simplify things a little to take the load off of your agency? For instance, what about companies who are hurt because their only competitors are foreign and are able to export finished products to the U.S. at little or no tariffs? Well, we have a process right now that we're following that we think is, is fair, and it, it, it looks at the competitive effect, whether products are available in other areas, uh, and whether or not it's the focus of China 2025. So we're happy with our current process, uh, but it's a, as you say, it's a big, big it's a big, big process. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Kind, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Cha Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for your testimony today, for the outreach that you've uh, been making uh, so far this year. I'm going to ask you to respond to a couple of questions in a moment, Mr. Ambassador, one of which is the level of cooperation or coordination you have with other nations in regards to what you're trying to accomplish as it relates to China. And the second one, is in regards to uh, the concern I have, that the longer this trade war with China lasts, the more market share we start losing in China, China pivots to other countries, and how difficult it's going to be to regain that market share, because back home in my district in Wisconsin, uh, my family farmers are getting hammered, and manufacturers. We had record bankruptcies for family farms last year alone with close to, well, well over 800. That trend is continuing. I'm not saying this trade war is the sole cause, but it certainly is piling on right now. So those are the two questions I'll ask you. But before I do that, I think it's safe to assume, and you've probably heard it from most members, that there's bipartisan consensus on the challenges that we face with China. You know, the IP theft, forced technology transfers, forced joint ventures, uh, what you're trying to accomplish in these negotiations. And there's bipartisan agreement on where we need to go and how we need to resolve this. But there is a difference of opinion on the tactics being used. There was another approach through a multilateral effort. Um, I still believe that our summarily rejecting the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement is going to go down as one of the great strategic mistakes we made in the 21st century. 
this president, this administration summarily rejected it without due consideration. Twelve nations in the largest and fastest growing economic region in the world, the Pacific Rim area, came up with standards and rules that elevate up to where we are, that China would have been on the outside looking in, would have isolated them and put great pressure on them, whether it was prohibition on IP theft, on forced technology transfers, on joint ventures, strong labor and environmental chapters, fully enforceable, e-commerce and digital trade chapter, everything that we're trying to accomplish right now to elevate standards to where we are. A prohibition against uh, localization rules, for instance, was contained in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Moving forward on that would have put, I think, incredible leverage on China, isolating them in the region, and now we're on the outside looking in, and China's uh, being able to help establish those rules of trade. At some point, we hope to be able to find a way to get back in that agreement rather than disadvantaging us uh, from that. But having said that, uh, let me go back to the original questions I asked in regards to the level of cooperation and coordination with other nations right now in, in regards to China. There's strength in numbers. And I think ultimately China will respond to the collective will of the international community much better than the unilateral action that we're taking against them today. And then finally, the lost market access uh, issue. So thank you, Congress. And I would say, first of all, I think getting out of TPP was the right decision. It was a bad agreement. It was poorly negotiated. And a car could have been manufactured 45 percent in Vietnam and 55 percent in China and sold in the United States duty free. Uh, didn't do much on currency, had a whole lot of problems, and in any event, to get to your geopolitical problem, had China joined it, they wouldn't have lived up to the rules, we would have had a problem. Number one. Number two, as you know well, we have, we have FTAs with six of the 11 countries that are in it already, and of the, of the other five, 95 percent of the GDP is in, China, is in Japan, where, with your support and help, we're negotiating. So I, that's our, now I've said my thing, but I said it like this period of time. Uh, in terms of cooperation, we are trying to do it on two tracks. We do want to cooperate with other countries. As I say, we have the trilateral thing. We're trying your approach. I would say, though, that your approach by itself uh, was less likely to be successful and indeed was tried by prior administrations unsuccessfully. So what we want to do is continue that approach, but also put in place the unilateral action that the president has taken. And I would note that that unilateral action is what has brought us to the point where we are now. We're on hopefully on the verge of beginning to, 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 to turn the corner. Um, in, in terms of... Uh, um, the gentleman will finish. Well, in terms of uh, trade, with, you know, trade with China, we hope that we can get these barriers down and, and we can do this before we lose our supply chains and our, our customers. Okay. Thank you. Thank that, you let Chairman. me recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Dr. Winstrup, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ambassador, for, for being here with us today. Uh, question a little little off track from China, but it does relate to China. Uh, my colleague uh, Terry Sewell and I have introduced the legislation to extend the Caribbean uh, Basin Trade Partnership Act uh, for another 10 years from 2020 to 2030. Uh, it's an important program to U.S. textile industry because it requires the use of U.S. made yarns. And for a country like Haiti, this, uh, gr this act allows their garment industry a fighting chance to compete with large Asian suppliers su such as China and Vietnam. And with the program set to expire and people trying to make investment decisions and production plans, uh, certainty is important, uh, important to U.S. companies, uh, but especially when doing business with, in a least developed country like Haiti. Do you foresee support for a reauthorization of this act? I, I'm not prepared to, to say I haven't studied it. I don't, I don't have an idea. The, the fact that you and um, uh, Congresswoman Sewell are in favor of it certainly is a very positive indicator from my point of view. Um, but, I, but I want to look at it, and I would also say that the generally the requirements of U.S. made yarn in, in, uh, in textiles going forward is something that I have, um, have, have supported as a matter of policy in, other, in a variety of other areas. And, uh, but I want to look at that so I can give you an informed op uh, opinion. So it hasn't come up in any talks with China and how it might affect them. So Pardon me? It hasn't come up in any conversations with China. As, as how it might affect them, or that they have a concern about it. No, no, that specifically it has okay. not. But one other uh, question, when it comes to China's retaliation, if you will, and, and some of the effects on agriculture and their access to markets, uh, you talk about some of the uh, non-tariff barriers 
and one of the things that's come to attention is these inspection requirements that aren't scientific based. Can, can you elaborate on some of the things that they're doing in, in that arena, if you will? I'd be happy to do that, Congressman. This is something that we spent an awful lot of time on. There's a whole lot of, as you know, um, technical barriers to trade or, or non-tariff barriers to trade, depending on what term you want to use. One of them that we spent probably the most single time on this whole issue of biotechnology and, and their approval processes. In the U.S., it's 18 to 24 months to get an approval. In China, there are ones that are seven and eight years and haven't had approval. It's, it's a very complicated process, and it is one where, where th 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 that has a, a very, very negative effect on the United States because in many cases, U.S. farmers will not introduce the, the technology themselves in the U.S. until it's approved in their major markets, one of which is China. So we spent a lot of time on that. Hopefully, we made some headway. The time was both to change things systemically and to put in time limits and the like. Whether we succeed on that, we'll see. I don't want to suggest that we will, but we did raise it and talk about it a great deal, that there be science-based uh, uh, decision-making, because right now there's not science-based decision-making in many, many cases, um, that there be time and that, and, and we have a long pipeline of, of, of things that have been stacked up for years and years and years and years and years. So we understand how important this is. They're changing their process and getting it really more in line with the international norms is something we spend a lot of time about and have it be science-based. So we'll see where that turns out. Uh, I don't want to suggest that those talks are over. We spent a lot of time on it, though, and we realize how important it is. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank the gentleman. That let me recognize the gentleman from New Jersey to inquire, Mr. Pasquale. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ambassador, uh, for filling Article One, Section 8, very clear that the Congress has a major role, the major role under Article One, in, in trade negotiations, and I thank you for appearing before us. Um, China needs to provide, we agree, greater access for U.S. services firms and allowing the ability to invest and operate independently from state-owned enterprises and, competitive, and competitively in the financial services, technology, and audiovisual sectors. Beyond the scope of the 301 report, I want to ask you about two things quickly. One, it has been reported that there will be an, a memorandum of agreement on currency in this deal. Uh, I've read your comments from the 2010 U.S.-China Security and Economic Commission in which you laid out your standards for combating currency manipulation. You laid them out very clearly. You argued in that presentation that China's practice of currency manipulation because it constitutes a counter available, countervaluable uh, subsidy under our CBD law. I agree. I have a bill that would treat it as such. You argued we should be, quote unquote, imaginative in dealing with this issue, including restricting imports or even requesting compensation for value of lost market access. Do the terms you have reached with China on currency, live up to your own standards on currency. Mr. Ambassador, make it as short as possible. Thank you. I'm not very good at that. <laughs> but None of I us are. I would, I would say, first of all, I think without question, the President has been imaginative, right? The whole 301 approach we've used has been something that people haven't used before, and it's had a huge difference. So I feel very comfortable that I've passed my own a standard of, of um, uh, imaginative, and, and I might say, in the case of the president, gritty, right? He had the grit to get this done. In terms of currency, um, they're, 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 it is certainly our objective, and once again, these provisions are never agreed to, everything's agreed to, that, that there be commitments not to do competitive devaluations. As, as Congressman, I think it was Thompson said, it's, uh, it's, it's complicated what's happened in the last couple of years, where we are on that, and I could argue that round, or I could argue it square, that those kind of decisions on currency manipulation are not made by me, of course, they're made by the Secretary uh, of Treasury, but they're, but they're complicated issues, but without question in the past, China has used currency manipulation 
and and our desires that there be commitments like that, as well as commitments to a certain amount of of of, um, of transparency. I hope for another meeting, uh, Ambassador. We will talk about the relationship between your job and the Treasurer's job in terms of trade, and where the, where exactly does the Congress fit in? Uh, do you think? Uh, labor or environmental issues are in the scope of the 301 negotiations? I would say to the extent that they are involved in these unfair trade practices, they are. But this is not like a free trade agreement where we're going across the board and looking at a whole variety of very important issues. So my scope is narrower here because it's based on 301. And, and, and by the way, I would love to work with you and other members who want to sit back and figure out a way that we can create new statutory authority that allows me to use something like 301 in these areas. I would love to sit down and talk Mr. to you. Mr. Chairman, can I just add one sentence? Please. Um, if, if your answer if not, my question, I'd point out the uh, agricultural market access is not in the scope of the 301 report, but you are negotiating these anyway. And so, you know, consistency, consistency, I'm not really, that's not my, the essence of my question, my point, which uh, my time is up. But I wanted you to take a look at that because it's caused some confusion and I would like some clarity on it. If at all possible, call me, write me, whatever you can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Estes, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Ambassador Lighthizer, for uh, joining us today. You know, as the representative of the air capital of the world and, and the breadbasket of America, trade's a critical issue for my district and for the state of Kansas. Uh, in fact, uh, According to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, trade supports over 108,000 jobs uh, for these exports and uh, the value over $17 billion uh, for the economy in our state. Uh, before I focus on, on uh, trade relationships with Ch China, I want to first thank you for your work on upgrading NAFTA and replacing it with the U.S.-Mexico-Canada uh, Free Trade Agreement. You know, Canada and Mexico are Kansas' top export markets worth about $3.5 billion. And since its adoption, NAFTA has been really beneficial for my district, particularly the farmers, ranchers, and aerospace manufacturers. Um, but the 20-year-old agreement did need some upgrading and, and uh, some reform efforts, and I'm thankful for that you, they've done that. And hopefully that uh, we can get through this process and get that ratified quickly so that we can, we can move forward with some of the other important issues that you're doing. Um, so let's go back today and focus as we want to on China. Um, you know, tariff retaliation from China has threatened Kansas exports worth about $525 million to China, um, led by a, a lot of grain products, soybeans, sorghum, cotton, beef, uh, as well as uh, aircraft manufacturing and other manufacturing. Uh, as a big supporter of fair, free and fair trade, I believe a prolonged trade war uh, with these tariffs is not the final outcome that any of us want. You know, as I've talked to Kansas farmers and, and manufacturers in the district, uh, I've heard over and over again how they support the president and believe we can get a better trade deal negotiating through, through strength. One of the things I think our colleagues on both sides of the aisle would agree that China's been harming American businesses and workers for decades. Uh, in fact, uh, we've seen so much cheating uh, over the years that uh, it's having a drastic impact. You know, for example, in 2013, a Chinese national was, was uh, arrested in Kansas uh, for attempting to steal some intellectual property regarding research uh, pertaining to rice seeds and uh, to send that to, China, to scientists in China. So I'm proud that President Trump's been one of the first presidents to stand up to these unfair trade practices and hope to bring uh, China to the table in a meaningful way to help make sure we have uh, free and fair trade agreements. Uh, since we've entered these negotiations with China, there's been a lot of, lot of positive steps and we want to make sure that we continue moving forward with some of those, those positive activities. Um, I don't want to stop there. You know, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, China has threatened exports from Kansas worth $525 million. And one of the things we want to make sure that, uh, you know, as I talk with constituents, that uh, uh, particularly with both in the farming community as well as aerospace and, and 
hopefully that uh, we can work on making sure that uh, the retaliatory and regulatory practices are fixed. And so I just want to talk a little bit about what you're seeing in that regards on your negotiation of, of uh, correcting those unfair practices. Well, uh, you know, thank you very much, Congressman. And thank you specifically for your support on USMCA. As you know, that's our top priority. And if if the Congress doesn't see fit to pass that, then everything else we're talking about is kind of like a footnote because it'll mean we can't do trade deals and we can't, uh, we're not going to be in the trade space. I mean, it's just, it would be such an admission of a uh, failure by all of us. So I'm very grateful for your support in that area. I would also note that that we talk about manufacturing jobs being lost because of Chinese practices. The, re the reality is that farmers have been hurt as much as anyone by their practices. That's a huge market. They're, they're our second or third biggest agricultural market if you, if, if you skip over 18 and go back to 17 in traditional years. But the reality is they should be buying much, much more agricultural products. And my hope is that these purchases as part of this, while not central, will lead to that, will, will lead to new markets that will, that will go on for years and years and years. Thank you, Ambassador. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, to inquire. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. I thank you for the work you've done and the work you are doing and for the candor in responding to inquiries and questions. I represent an area in Chicago known as Chinatown. And I'm trying to figure out what it is that I say to the Chinese American Chamber of Commerce there when I go and meet with them. And so I'd like to know as specifically as I could when it comes to disregard for intellectual properties protection currency manipulation, and market access for U.S. businesses that are trying to do business in China, given the fact that it is an enormous market. Um, what can I say and tell the Chamber of Commerce in Chinatown that I'm doing, or we're doing, you're doing? Well, uh, you know, thank you very much, Congressman. Um, I, I would say this, first of all, Chinese Americans and Chinese, many Chinese businessmen themselves, but Chinese American businessmen universally have said uh, to the president and to me for the president, hang tough, this is really, really, really important. We have to do things that lead to reform in China. We are not forcing reform in China. We are working with reformers in China who want to reform China. And, and nobody knows better how important that is than Chinese American business people, men and women. They absolutely know what the problem is. And, and they, they realize also what the potential is. If China takes a step forward and, and, and changes these practices, the potential for them and, and really the potential for us, but also I would say the potential for China is enormous. Uh, and that's why, in fact, China has, um, has reformers and that's why it has people who want to change some of these policies. The reality is that, that all of our businesses and, and their group probably more than any are afraid to do business at some tier. They're afraid to do business with China because they will lose not only what we think of as technology, but also know-how, just how they do business, uh, that they will not have their intellectual property protected uh, and respected, um, and that there are huge markets that, I could, that they could open up if we get this kind of thing uh, reformed. But, but I am now would be really interested the next time you go back and do that and talk to them if you call me and tell me and I'll come up and talk to you because I'd be very interested to know what their reaction is to what we're doing. I find these people follow this stuff really a lot closer than most Americans do. And when I talk to them, they're like, hang tough. Don't go for the, as many congressmen of your colleagues, don't go for the soybean solution. Go for the structural change. This is our one chance. I, I'd be really interested to get your to get your feedback after you talk to these men and women. We'll make sure we do that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize Mr. Schweikert to inquire. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Ambassador, um, let's face it, some of the best questions have already been asked. So I, I actually have um, a one-off. How do we future-proof? Let's say you have amazing success. Um, you know, we, you know, the angels sing, whatever happens. What do we do to future-proof a success? Um, is it time that those of us here in Congress uh, have a serious discussion on streamlining the WTO, um, its uh, level of being almost ineffectual, um, you know, the, the, the number of filings that you know, when we, we read through them, we're a decade later and a tweak has been made and the bad acts are still happening. What do we do so we're not back having the same discussion a year, two years, three years from now? Okay, well, thank you, Congressman. I want you to know that after the number of hearings that I've done before the committee, whenever I think of the future, I think of you. <laughs> you're always going to ask me a question about that. I should be thinking more about the future. So I, I, I it's either a good thing or an annoying thing. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 it's a good thing in my opinion. It's, uh, we, we all have a tendency to think about the here and now probably more than we should. So thinking about going off into the future is something that's important. I would say number one, having a realistically, having a real enforcement process. That enforcement process is going to. As you resolve issues, if you're doing it properly, you're going to be resolving issues in ways that, that, that turn up new problems and new trends. And I think you have to be able to deal within that process. Um, and, and as I, I've tried to say, I'm not Pollyanna. I don't believe that this is going to solve all the problems between the United States and China. We have very different systems. They're in a process of reform, or they're not. Depends on who you talk to. If they're in a process as reform, we'll, we'll make headway. If they're not, we're going to go right back to having problems. But, but I think there is a role for the international bodies. I absolutely do. And I think WTO reform is an important part of it. But with that, if, if it's a process, um, the sins on the bilateral organizations, is it the timeline, the ability to stall, or is it um, just the actual adjudication process itself? What can we help in reforming so we're not doing this all the time? I would say, first of all, trying to look to the future and try to reduce uh, problems is a healthy and important process. But, but I, I believe we're going to have problems in any way. So I think we're going to be back here and we're going to be working our way through problems and try to work through those problems always with one eye to the future. But, but this enforcement process, if we have an agreement, once again, we don't have an agreement, will be very specific. It'll have layers, it'll have time frames, and there will be reaction. And, and working with Congress on WTO uh, reform is something that, that, that I'm eager to engage in at, you know, when, when, when your schedule re, you know, permits it. I think there are problems with the WTO that we have to address, and it hasn't risen to the, uh, to the occasion with respect to at least non-market economies. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, look, to that point, one of my great interests is, you know, I believe there's technology disruptions, there's always economic disruptions, there's, you know, financing um, um, uh, technology that's going to create international disruptions, and we will need some types of dip dispute mechanisms that move efficiently. Um, how many times have we had constituents come to our office saying, well, we were part of this WTO complaint, but <clears throat> by the time the lawyer fees and everything, we're sitting here, you know, a decade later, we gave up. And I'm, it, it would be a, a powerful thing as, as, as we look at this all over the world. Can we be helpful in fixing that process? And with that, I yield back, Mr. Thank Chairman. the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to Ambassador Lighthizer for joining us today. A number of my colleagues have talked about, have prior they have mentioned, um, enforcement mechanisms. Um, and I'm wondering if you are able to share with any specificity how you intend any agreements with China to be enforced. Well, well, thank you very much, Congresswoman. I would say uh, I, I'll do it with limited specificity. OK. 
Okay. So there will be, if we have an agreement, there will be a process that has been agreed to where at the, at the office director level, there'll be, there'll be monthly meetings, and then I'll go through the process, then I'll take a step back. At the, at the vice ministerial level, there will be um, quarterly meetings, and then there'll be semi-annual meetings at the ministerial level. That would be me and, and the vice premier, who is my counterpart in this. And the idea is two things. One, individual companies will come to us with complaints about practices, and we'll be able to work those through the process. In many cases, those are gonna to have to be anonymous because companies are afraid to come forward because they know what'll happen if they do. They'll have real world effects that'll be negative. And then in addition to that, there'll be systemic problems where we will see patterns developing and series of things that we, that we disagree with and we will bring those through the process. Hopefully in most cases, they'll be resolved at the first or second level. If not, they'll be resolved at my level and if, if there's disagreement at my level, then the United States would expect to act proportionately but unilaterally to insist on enforcement. But without that kind of thing, uh, and, and I should say this is a fairly unique idea, right? I mean, this is not something that has a lot of precedent. But without that sort of thing, to me, the, the, then we don't have real commitments. Thank you, that's helpful to, because, of course, many people complain that if there's no enforceability, then our trade agreements are not really worth the paper that they're written on. Um, and I know that there are a number of moving parts in the ongoing ne um, negotiations, but one sector that I want to call to your attention because it's very important to the ec economic viability of Southern California is the creative industry. 95% um, of people who are involved uh, in the creative industry in LA are union workers who have uh, quality negotiated benefits and retirement plans. And uh, the audiovisual sector at large is pretty much hamstrung um, by how to invest and distribute in China. Specifically, I want to call your attention for uh, current MOU negotiations. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I want to call to your attention a commitment that was made by the Chinese in 2012. Uh, in the 2012 film agreement, they said that in 2017, they would provide, quote, additional meaningful compensation, end quote, in terms of increasing revenue shares to U.S. studios. Um, and it seems clear that a revenue share of at least 40% of gross box office would be consistent with international norms. Given that resolving this issue would be indicative of China's compliance with the WTO obligations under a trade dispute settlement, can you confirm that that is a priority uh, for the negotiations and a trade deal with China? Uh, yes, Congressman, absolutely it's a priority. It's something we spent a fair amount of time talking about. They know precisely where we are. As you know, it's a complicated issue. The, the key point, revenue sharing isn't that, isn't that complicated, though. Uh, they can try to, make Secretary Mnuchin is very much involved. He, of course, knows a great deal about that industry a lot more than I do. The distribution thing becomes more complicated. There should be some, some changes there, too. But what we haven't done is things that will challenge control, right? It's, it's, it's not something that we want to bring into this, the idea of challenging control in, the, in, in China. But this, this idea of the, the, the revenue sharing, I, the, 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 I don't want to get into the details, but, but I think you probably know them exactly as well as I do. That is something that has not been resolved. It's something we've spent time on. It's something we understand the importance of. Thank you. I appreciate that, and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Arrington, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was going to refrain from bragging about West Texas, but I had so many of my colleagues talk about their district. So let me just say, Mr. Lighthizer, West Texas is the food, fuel, and fiber capital of the United States of America. And um, we feed and clothe the American people. We fuel the American economy. That's fossil and renewable. And we provide energy independence and food security. And um, I'm proud to represent our hardworking farmers and ranchers, and they're concerned. And these are desperate times. And I know you know this, uh, Mr. Ambassador, but, <clears throat> and by the way, good work, great work, hard work, and I know this is a long-term proposition. It's a long-term game changer. And nobody knows about the inequities and the unfairness and the way the Chinese, uh, their, their bad actions and unfair um, <clears throat> trade practices better than, than, uh, than our farmers out in West Texas, especially our cotton farmers. So keep up the great work. But times are tough. And I just want to remind you that over the last few years, we've seen a decline of over 50% in farm income in the United States uh, ag industry, 
Um, that's, that's the steepest decline since the Great Depression. 40% uh, roughly increase in bankruptcies. And I'm sad to report that uh, farmers have the highest suicide rate in the United States of any profession, five times the national average. Times are desperate. <clears throat> and our farmers, in spite of that, and our ranchers, they stand with this president 100%. They'll stand with him right up until they have to sell the family farm. But they love him and they appreciate him and he, they know that he's fighting for them. Um, let me talk about cotton because when you fly into Lubbock International Airport, you're gonna land in the uh, largest cotton patch in the world. We produce about a third of the world's, of the co cotton that we export out of the United States. But we've lost 50% of our market share in China, and it is an awfully big uh, market. Uh, we want reforms, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, we want the equitable, reciprocal, and enforceable structural reforms that you talk about. We're Americans first. We want that for every American um, job creator, manufacturer, producer. Um, but you've mentioned this, um, the purchase commitment, and we've heard a lot about soybeans, a little bit about pork. Talk about cotton, because uh, we have 17 state cotton belt, $21 billion industry. We produce the most and the best cotton in the world, but, but that uh, Chinese market, we're, as a result of that 50% loss, our guys are, are suffering. Can you talk about uh, cotton being uh, mentioned in your purchase commitment discussions with the Chinese, please? So, first of all, um Thank you for that, and particularly for the comments about the support for the president. As you know well, you, you can't talk to the president about trade without having the farmers come up, right? It's like the first thing he talks about is usually the last thing he talks about, too. So he's, and Secretary Purdue, as you know, is, is I, I don't know all the secretaries of agriculture, but I can't imagine there's ever a better one. He's just full on everything for, for agriculture. and. We happen to be in the middle of a long-term trend that has been very bad. So uh, all of that is appreciated, and, and the president keeps us very focused on it, as does the secretary. In terms of the purchase commitment, absolutely cotton is a factor. It's something that China needs, has traditionally bought, um, and it's easy to buy more of. So it is something we understand that these people have, have, have suffered, and it's something that's in the list of things that we expect them to have substantial increases on, and it's something the president keeps us very focused on. And I, I have specifically gone through with the president the various items, so I'm talking to the president of the United States about these numbers for these ag. And by the way, it's these big commodities, it's hazelnuts. I've had, I mean, there's a lot of things that I've had members talk to me about, and, I'm, and, the, I, and I keep track of it, and I, I go through it dutifully. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Now, based upon the ratio present in the room, we will now move to two Democrats and then recognize one Republican. Ms. Delbeni is recognized to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for being here with us today. Um, I was pleased last month uh, we saw 76 countries agree to start negotiations to develop global rules on e-commerce. However, I'm concerned that um, the recent inclusion of China in these talks could weaken those overall efforts and lead to a watered down agreement since their current digital regime is so radically different than ours. Um, in your bilateral talks with the Chinese, are you pushing them to address critical issues like data localization, um, forced disclosure of source code, restrictions on cloud service providers, and banning customs duties on electronic transmissions? Um, this would not only help many American companies operate in China, but would also help make China a more constructive partner in important multilateral negotiations like the e-commerce initiative. And if we don't address these issues immediately, we risk creating new digital borders, and those digital borders could create massive disruptions in the digital supply chains that we have. So I'd love your thoughts on how you're addressing this issue, these issues. Well, you know, thank you very much, Congressman. You know this is something that I care about, so I'm putting this in the softball category. Um, number one, I completely agree with you. Strategically, what we should be doing is having a small group that writes real rules on e-commerce and then expand the group to other people. 
the more people you bring into the negotiation, the harder it is to get any rules that you and I would think of and many other members would think of as actually world-class kind of rules. The kind of rules we need, by the way, I would just point out, are in USMCA, right? That's like the gold standard for all of this stuff. It's the absolute gold standard for all this stuff. Uh, and it's probably a, a bridge too far with respect to some of these people. But I think bringing China in it will not help these these negotiations, that's number one. Number two, are we dealing with these issues with China? Absolutely. We spend an enormous amount of time on, total, um, on data localization, on, on, on data transfer, on, on uh, source codes uh, requirements in a whole variety of areas. And, and I mean down to absolutely the, 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 the most minute detail. And I'm happy to sit down with you at some point and kind of go through it just so you can get some actual appreciation, but I mean, it's me sitting down with it, with the, you know, among the most senior officials there talking about precisely what, where there are circumstances in which it's appropriate to require source codes. And there are some, I mean, you know, emergency rooms. I mean, there are some strange things, but we have had a very, uh, we haven't concluded, we're not done yet, but we have made headway. Uh, it, it's whatever it is, it's not going to be what you and I think of as a model agreement, but we will make substantial progress, I believe. And these are really, really important issues that, and I, I agree completely with you, this is one of those things. We should lock in rules that, pr that, that, that stop um, barriers in the beginning of an industry. Once you get protectionism set in all over the world, it's much harder to change practices than it is to have people adopt uh, best practices at the beginning. And so it's, it's very important. It's also a big issue for just colloquially for us. We're good at it and we ought to have that. So as you know, um, U.S. technology companies and specifically um, cloud service providers face significant market restrictions and forced technology transfer requirements in China. Um, the 301 tariffs also impact them because another key inputs to data centers um, are subject to these tariffs. And so, particularly when we talk about that, I'd like to know what your commitments are to pursuing forced technology transfers, but also are you looking at things like eliminating foreign equity caps and uh, licensing requirements so that U.S. companies don't have to rely on Chinese companies to operate? Yes. Thank you. I know we're out of time. We can follow up more, too. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlelady. With that, let me recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Chu, to inquire. Yes, uh, Ambassador. Lighthizer. I represent Los Angeles, the heart of the film, television, and music industry, and uh, also I'm co-chair of the Congressional Creative Rights Caucus. And I wanted to follow up on what you said earlier about the um, unfair uh, practices affecting the film industry. Uh, part of the unfair practices has to do with the revenue share, of course. Uh, the uh, average for the nation in terms of revenue sharing with regard to films in China is 40%. But for the U.S., the revenue sharing is 25 percent. And so um, that, I believe, is so important to address. But on top of all of this, um, the U.S. film industry brought a, a market access case against China to the World Trade Organization. The World Trade Organization ruled in favor of the film industry, and an MOU was entered into by both parties. And in that MOU, the Chinese committed to engaging in consultations in 2017 and provide additional meaningful compensation in terms of that revenue share. So my question is, have they engaged in those consultations, which were supposed to be done in 2017? And if not, what is your plan for enforceability in this regard? So. We have had discussions, and we have had discussions that predated the current 301 process. But now, because we haven't made sufficient uh, progress, we're folding them into this 301 process, and it is one of the services issues. The revenue share, as you said, is crucial, but also trying to make some improvement on the distribution side of things, because the reality is that, that competition there helps also. Um, you know, how, I, I don't know if I can predict uh, success. I would say they are very difficult negotiations, uh, you know, as of the last time they were here. But um, your industry is very well represented by, by you and other members and by MPAA. And so 
you know, it's, we're focused very much on it, and, uh, and I think making it part of these negotiations um, increases the likelihood of a successful outcome. But it's, it's a, a difficult issue. You, you find just philosophically in all these kinds of areas that you sort of dig in, and you say, why is there this or that protectionism? And it's almost always a situation where there's a, an interest in the other country that has an actual, you know, is getting richer as a result of it. It's very seldom philosophy, although there are cases where it is. But in this case, there are people there who make money on basically squeezing us, number one. Number two, they want to develop their own industry. Yeah. So there are, as you know, I don't have to go through it. You know the reasons why we have this problem, but it's something that we are focused on. Hopefully we'll come to a conclusion. We're not asking for the moon at all. What we're asking for is what, what is normal. Well, I thank you for continuing to press on that issue uh, in, these, in these trade negotiations. Also, I wanted to make a, a statement about uh, a company in my district, iRobot, which uh, employs 675 American workers, engineers, scientists, uh, and... Uh, uh, which developed the famous um, Roomba, the robot, robotic vacuum. Uh, so it employs so many people in my district, but uh, uh, the Roomba is manufactured in China, and uh, the, the iRobot is on that third list of uh, tariffs. Right now, iRobot is paying 10% in retaliatory duties, but it may go up to 25% if the deal is not reached. Um, and so uh, they are... They are very, very anxious about uh, uh, having uh, some way to apply for exclusions for that third list, and I just uh, hope that uh, you can make that process happen. Well, I, I have certainly taken the position that if we go to 25 percent, we will. I've made that commitment to have an exclusion process. Short of that, I want to sort of see where we are, and I hope that they're thinking about ways to manufacture more in the U.S. Uh, yes. Thank the gentle lady. That let me recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Holding, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador, always a pleasure. I'm very glad to see that the administration is willing to tackle China's unfair trade practices rather than just talking about it and complaining about it. I think we have bipartisan support in the room to agree that China's a strategic trading partner that plays by the rules when it behooves them but otherwise ignores them. Um, and Mr. Ambassador, as you know, I'm from North Carolina, which not only has the best barbecue in the country, but we're also <laughs> one of the leading uh, pork producing states uh, in the country. I'm glad I didn't hear any objection to that. The, uh, <laughs> so, we won't subtract that from the gentleman's time. <laughs> uh, in 2017, the U.S. shipped over a billion dollars in pork to China. Um, but with punitive tariffs, over 50 percent of our port exports to China have showed, slowed down to a trickle. Uh, the lost sales to China have caused hog producers in my state uh, to lose $8 uh, per hog and collectively an annualized loss of a billion dollars. And I know you've made progress with agricultural purchases, especially for soy and poultry, and I appreciate your good work there on behalf of my farmers. Uh, but obviously, uh, there's a tremendous demand for pork in China, and with the Chinese pork production in steep decline because of African swine fever, it seems like it is time um, for significant U.S. pork shipments to China, uh, which would, of course, put a big dent in the trade imbalance. So can you give us any indications as to where you are on pork market access in the negotiations? So thank you, Congressman. Yes, that's uh, but you're, you're absolutely right. Pork is one of the issues that's uh, very important to us. Uh, before we talk about the purchasing, it's also important on the SPS area where we have specific problems with, with uh, um, lack, I'd say lack of scientific uh, basis for some of their restrictions. So that's another area in which it comes in. Um, if a pork is something we've talked about, we would expect if we have a deal that there would be substantial pork improvements, particularly as you know well, Given the fact that that uh, China is in is in I mean has issues with their own pork production right now that are substantial, and uh, and this is something we have talked about it. it it has been quite specifically addressed and we we have gone back and forth with numbers, so um, and I'm happy to talk to you about it offline. But we are we are making headway and if there's a deal, 
and if there's a package, I'm confident that there will be a, uh, you know, there will be substantial good news for, for our pork producers. Thank you. Switching to the 301 tariffs, um, you know, we're working with you uh, to find ways to work on the exclusion, exclusion process. Um, one option in particular I'd like to work with you on is the criteria that expeditiously excludes products that are regulated by other U.S. government agencies where those regulations already constrain the ability of importers to access uh, those products. For example, products regulated by the FDA where the FDA's regulatory framework means that consumers cannot quickly shift uh, to other suppliers. The existing regulations uh, by our government already constrain supply for the consumer, and I believe we have an opportunity with the list three exclusion process to address these products and minimize consumer impact. So that's the area which I you know, hope that we can uh, work on together uh, in the future. Um, that doesn't really require an answer, and I'm out of time. And that works well. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentlelady from Wisconsin to inquire. Ms. Moore. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I do want to thank the ambassador for his patience and indulgence. Many, uh, a lot of uh, stuff has been covered already, so I won't to regale you with the repetition. I, I do want to say that uh, the, while these tariffs have had uh, draconian impacts on all of our um, constituents and districts, um, they're having an impact on China as well. But many economists seem to think that China is adapting and that they're recovering. One of the things they're doing is by expanding their export markets. So uh, a question that hasn't been asked is, we don't have a functioning export-import bank now. Do you think that that's having a, um, an adverse impact uh, on our um, uh, trade position? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, the answer is yes, it's having an impact, and it's way beyond China, and it's costing us jobs, and there's no excuse for it, in my opinion. Okay, so, thank you. I don't know what else to say. I, 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 All right, I know what to say, but I won't carry you there. Um, <laughs> the, you have talked a lot about science-based decision-making. Um, I was also, one of the things that our companies have leaned into, and it was a provision of Dodd-Frank, uh, where companies would report and refrain from using conflict minerals in their products. I was wondering, um, is, is that a consideration for, uh, in terms of unfair trade practices for China to use conflict minerals, thus undercutting the prices of, uh, of uh, their products? It, it's, I'm, of course, sympathetic to your objective. It's not something that we've talked about, and if there is a specific unfair trade action that we should be thinking about, I'd be happy to work with you about it, but it's okay. not something we spent time talking Okay, about. I would love to work with you on that, because that could severely uh, undercut uh, our products, our iPhones with these minerals in it. We, we want to make sure that they're not being produced or taken from countries where people are being murdered uh, and I'm, unfair labor practices. I'm very sympathetic to your... I, I do want to follow up with uh, my colleague uh, on the Republican side talked about lists of things that are really critical. And I know that my colleague from Wisconsin uh, probably waxed on about how this is hurting uh, our folks in Wisconsin. More specifically, I have an initiative to try to prevent um, sudden infant death syndrome. And one of the products that we have found to be very effective uh, and cost effective, especially for poor women, is something that's marketed in the United States as a pack and play. Uh, it's a cribbet that's only made in China and it's, all, it's been subject, subject to these 10% tariffs, and, and if we were to continue these tariffs, um, it would be out of the reach of many consumers. And so I was wondering how to get these pack and plays on that list of, uh, of uh, don't touch items. Because it, it, we can't get these pack and plays from anywhere else. Well, thank you, first of all, and I can't help but say how important USMCA is for Wisconsin. Now, having said that, um, I, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm, uh, my guess is we ought to be manufacturing pack and plays in the United States. Why is it that they can't be manufactured here? 
Well, yeah, can please. you manufacture them before my great granddaughter is born March 23rd? Well, maybe we'll just let you use my granddaughter's version. <laughs> she can just say she doesn't need it anymore. She's outgrown it. So, no, I, I, I don't want to be flip about it. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic. The, 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 the bottom line is we ought to be manufacturing these things in the United States. That's what our objective is. We ought to be paying people here to manufacture these things. And, um, and, and I would also say a 10% tariff on that product, assuming it doesn't go up, assuming it doesn't go up, a 10% tariff on that product versus what it would have cost six months ago with the, with the devaluation of the Chinese currency, it's probably a 2 or 3% increase in price. My guess is it's not going to price too many people out. And if the, if the cost of that 2 or 3% on the price of that is a bunch of people have jobs that they wouldn't otherwise have, I'd, you know, personally, that's a trade I'd make. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Michigan to inquire, Mr. Kildee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing, and thank you, Ambassador uh, Lighthizer, for being here. And beyond that, thank you for your willingness to, um, to engage with us on a regular basis. It makes a difference, and I, I very much appreciate that. You've been quite accessible. Uh, and I have a question, um, but I, before I get into that, I'd also want to note uh, how much I appreciate you bringing up the polysilicon issue um, with the Chinese during these negotiations. It's important that we address China's retaliatory tariffs in response to legitimate American trade remedies. That's important to me. It's important to my district, and I appreciate your efforts in that regard. Obviously, the Congress and the administration need to work together to deal with, uh, with China and to hold China accountable for unfair practices that are costing American jobs. And there, I think, is general agreement on that score, bipartisan agreement. Many of us wish that it was more of a, a multilateral approach. But one area that I know was addressed, but I wasn't here to hear your answer, um, has to do with currency manipulation. President Trump promised to label China a currency manipulator on his first day in office during his campaign. Obviously, that didn't happen. And I know you agree with the President's general sentiment that China engages in bad behavior and manipulates currency. In fact, in 2010, you testified to this committee that China would be labeled, should be labeled a currency manipulator and was in violation of its WTO obligations. You have thoughtfully outlined a list of actions that the U.S. needs take to address China's currency manipulation, but I would like to get your perspective on whether or not the understanding that the President recently announced with China on currency issues meets the requirements that you had laid out in your previous testimony. Simply put, does this deal meet the standards that you laid out in 2010? Well, th thank you. I appreciate that. I, I, I would say, first of all, whether or not China is manipulating its currency right now, competitive, it is an issue that we can talk about. It, it probably is, but it's probably not manipulating it to lower its currency. It's probably manipulating it to raise its currency because they're at, in a different position than they were in 2010. So that's one thing I would say. It is not a foregone conclusion that China is manipulating its currency down right now. And I would say that, that this is a decision that the Secretary of uh, Treasury makes in conjunction with the President, not me. But I do not think you can make a case that right now China is intervening in the market to have their currency be weaker. Right? That's not in their interest, and they're probably doing the exact opposite of it. Have they done it in the past, in my judgment? Absolutely true. And were they doing it when I made that testimony? That's absolutely true. And I, I don't think you can rule out the possibility that some moment in the future we could see that happen again. And that's why the structural approach to these issues is more important than looking at this moment in time or even in the context of a deal that we might see negotiated is, is founded on some temporary transactional benefits as opposed to structural benefits. I, I completely agree with your statement, absolutely 100 percent. And what we're trying, what we want to get is commitments to not have competitive devaluations in the future and to a certain level of transparency. If you have those two things and they're enforceable, then you can, you can guard against that problem in the future. I, I, and, and, I, and the other point I made before you weren't here is that this is an issue beyond China. We think of it as China. It's, it's, there's a lot of places in Asia where this is a problem and a lot of places where it has been a problem in the past. 
and there's a lot of people in the United States that aren't working right now because of this issue. A lot of people who were told, well, you just didn't do a good job, and they were doing a fine job. They just got cheated on currency. My right, time's expired. I, I appreciate your, uh, your attention to these issues. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Smith, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for making um, time to be here today. Uh, today, here we're, to, we're here to talk about China. China has been taking advantage of U.S. workers for a long time, and I think that the President, along with yourself, Ambassador, um, deserves a lot of credit for sticking, um, sticking your net, neck out on this very difficult issue. It's clear that progress is being made and that there's real potential for positive structure changes after years of deception and false promises from China. A lot has been reported on the recent negotiations and I appreciate the light um, you're able to shed on this process. The news we heard last week about new Chinese purchases of U.S. soybeans is especially encouraging from someone who represents a very large agriculture district in southeast Missouri. I'm hopeful that we can achieve more than just the status quo with China but go well beyond current market access. I would like to reiterate the comments that was made uh, from uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Arrington, in regards to cotton. Um, the only thing I would disagree with that is Missouri cotton is a little bit better than Texas cotton. But um, we definitely uh, are like-minded when it's about opening up the markets. I do want to bring up uh, rice, uh, which is extremely important to the boot hill. Um, rice, form, rice farmers uh, have been fighting for over a decade for access to Chinese markets. While the administration has made progress in gaining access, um, since 2017, China has been displacing U.S. rice in our territories by undercutting the price. So while U.S. rice struggles for access, China's access to our domestic market below traded prices continues to grow um, are you and the administration investigating the situation, and what are you doing to address it? So, thank you, Congressman. Yes, absolutely. Um, first of all, the, uh, to your first point, uh, structural issues are, are fundamental to what we're talking about, and I, I've tried to make that point. I read in the media all the time. I read today uh, in, in the New York Times that we weren't making any headway on structural and it didn't even cite anybody. It made some other comments, by the way, and it cited contacts of Lighthizer. I thought, what's a contact? Is that like somebody I bump into at the grocery store? Contacts. That's a source. It's a contact. But that's another issue. I won't get into it. In any event, uh, any further than I already have, the fact is that we, we are making headway on structural issues, contrary to what may be read here and there, and the President believes they are central to having what anyone would consider to be a great agreement. And that's what his instructions to me, his instructions to me are, you have to get a great agreement, or we have no agreement, we'll just wait until we can get a great agreement. So, now on the specific issue of rice, yes, rice number one is a subject of purchasing that we have to have. Um, number two, we have, as you know well, we have two WTO cases, one of which we have, we have won and been announced, the other which has been decided but it hasn't become public, so I won't tell, tell you where we are on that, but those are two cases, and resolving those cases in the context of this agreement is something else that we're talking about. So whether we succeed in that, we'll see. But, but, but in, and on the issue of, of, of unfair Chinese uh, access in the United States. If, if, if there are issues where someone has a case uh, that, that they want to bring and have my office talk about, I'm happy to talk about it. I, I as you know very well, because we've talked a lot, I'm completely into enforcement. I think if we don't enforce these laws, the whole basic uh, uh, consensus in favor of the trading system breaks down, and I think it has broken down. So I'm happy to act on that, to, you know, very quickly. Thank you, Ambassador. I have several other questions I'll just submit for the record, hopefully, hopefully to get the response, but appreciate your response. Thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Beyer. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And Ambassador, thank you so much for, for being with us all this time. You know, Ambassador, we've been discussing, and of course, you're particularly compelling on the point about how China simply refuses to operate under what we consider to be a lawful and rules-based trading system. And of course, this extends beyond just trading rules. On Monday, Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein spoke at CSIS about what he called China's transactional approach to the law. 
citing China's willingness to detain foreign nationals on specious charges to gain negotiating leverage or force an outcome from a foreign government. This isn't how our justice system works, or it's not supposed to work that way. After the Huawei CFO's arrest, the president said, quote, if I think it's good for what will certainly be the largest trade deal ever made, which is a very important thing, what's good for national security, I would certainly intervene if I thought it was necessary, end quote. And during your meeting in the Oval Office with the Chinese Vice Premier, the President again discussed the possibility of, quote, talking to the U.S. attorneys, quote, and talking to the Attorney General. He hinted further that this would be a subject for trade talks. I know you're not responsible for law enforcement. I know you're not responsible for the Huawei prosecution. But you're certainly responsible for the trade deal. Are you familiar at all with any further discussions within the administration regarding using this case as leverage for trade negotiations? We've seen firsthand that you're willing to be forthright with the President. Are you not concerned that adopting a transactional approach to the criminal justice system, close to what the Chinese would do, will undermine our own legal system and incentivize reciprocal actions, as we've already seen with the Chinese targeting of Canadian citizens? I'm not aware of anything on this subject. I don't, I don't get involved with it, and I'm, I'm not aware of it in, 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 at all involved in what I'm doing. All right. Thank you. In most of our national trade discourse, particularly the popular discourse, centers around heavy manufacturing and agriculture, despite the fact that 75% of Americans employed in the private sector work in services of one form or other. In my district, we have tens of thousands support their families with good jobs across a wide range of services. I know you really focus on the trade deficit in goods and left out services altogether. I always want to make sure that we know we run a surplus in services. But nevertheless, both the National Trade Estimate and the Chinese WTO Compliance Report Note that American service companies face significant trade barriers across a number of sectors. And given our general competitive advantage in these areas, it's safe to assume the service surplus could be a lot larger. China places significant restrictions on legal services, ICT, cloud services, a whole range. Can you provide us with some detail on how the concerns raised about services are addressed in your current talks? And can we expect concrete changes in com Chinese competitive behavior in this sector too? Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm, I'm remiss in not making that point clearly. Um, services is a crucial part of what we talked about, and we spent a lot of time on it. I have my, brought my, one of my many negotiation books, which I'll be happy to show you at some time, because somebody looked at it and saw all the notes, and they said, God, that really is a terrible job you have, Lighthizer. But here it is. Banking services we spent a lot of time on. Cloud computing services. Uh, credit rating services, electronic payment, express delivery. I won't go through all of them here because someone will say, my God, insurance services. I mean, we spent a lot of time in great detail right down to the, to the sub, sub, sub section on, on pages and pages and pages of, of, uh, of services. And you're exactly right. Services jobs are equally good jobs. The United States has a surplus in, in services, which is very important, and millions and millions of people work on them, and and um, and we should be doing much better because in many areas we are by far the most competitive in the world. So this had an enormous amount of, of time spent on it, and uh, and and I'm uh, it's sort of less thematic and more specific, right? If you can follow what I mean in these negotiations, but but there was progress made on a number of these fronts. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Ambassador. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, Mr. Ambassador, would like to thank you for coming before this committee today. <clears throat> uh, there are 100 Chinese firms operating in Pennsylvania, supporting over 3,000 jobs. Pennsylvania imports over $17 billion from China, and Pennsylvania exports $2.5 billion to China. Mandarin is the third most spoken language in Philadelphia. But the question that keeps coming up, and this came from our Department of Economic Development, is the issue around intellectual property when it comes to investment. The concern, and this question has probably been asked over and over again to you, so forgive me for repeating it again. The issue about intellectual property of our domestic companies to protect long term, can you speak specifically to that again? Oh, absolutely, Congressman. Um, First of all, I will repeat one that I said before, and, and that is that we have found, I have found, that, that Chinese Americans are the, 
just almost to a person, ones who will say, hang tough, we need structural change. This is the only way we're gonna get structural change. Don't cave, don't sell out for soybeans or what, all the kinds of things that, that you and I have talked about and we both agree on. So, uh, and, and I think that Chinese Americans will be people who will, number one, they have a stake in a change in that system and number two, they have, they'll, they'll be beneficiaries uh, from, a, from a business point of view. On the IP front, China has very little IP protection right now. What we did in, in this negotiation, and I'm, I'm gonna talk to you later and I'm gonna stick all this in front of you. We went through section by section by section of what normal, what we would consider to be sort of best practices intellectual property protection are, and we negotiated those provisions. We didn't get everything we want, but you need things like a proper definition of, of, of what intellectual property is, a proper definition of what trade secrets are. You have to make sure you have criminal enforcement at some point in the process. You have to make sure you have, you have deterrent level penalties because if you don't have that, you have a problem. You have to make sure you have neutral people making decisions. It's all the kinds of things that you would say, yeah, that's more or less what we, what we would expect in a system. Now there's variation and we, as I say, we didn't get all of it. But the people with whom we dealt in China want to, they want to reform this process. I think they legitimately want to reform it. I think they legitimately um, view themselves as creators of, of intellectual property instead of just consumers of it. And that's, that's a, when that changes, people have a different attitude. So Chinese creators of intellectual property now want protection and have more uh, power than they would have in the past. So, we have an enormous amount of detail. I'll just spend 10 seconds and show you my book when we're together and you can sort of see, but this was a detailed discussion. It's extremely important. Uh, and, and I would say the final thing, when they put this in place to the extent it's agreed to because they think it's in their interest too, then there'll be the enforcement issue, right? And we'll be going down and it's gonna be as a change for China to do this, but it's something they seem to want to do. Real quick, Mr. Ambassador, you raised the issue about banking. Development projects and companies relying on Chinese investment to infuse capital into their projects and work. The restrictions on capital inflow is a concern for future investment. Well, look, at the president wants Chinese investment just like he wants everybody else's investment. That creates jobs and it helps Americans. What we don't want is investment in areas where they're gonna end up taking crucial technology from the United States. So there's a balance there and some people will come in and what they really want is technology and not investment. In other case, they want investment. The president's position and the secretary of, of treasury's position is quite clear. We want investment from China, just like we do from everyone else, but we don't want investment where it's gonna go into crucial technologies and end up losing technologies, which is gonna hurt us in the kind of things that Mr. Byron talked about for, uh, you know, at, 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 and cares a lot about. So there's a balance there, and it's, it's very important that we meet that um, you know, balance properly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank the gentleman with that. We will recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. LaHood, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ambassador Lighthizer. Welcome back and uh, thank you for your toughness on China. And um, you are, we're lucky to have you as our negotiator uh, going up against China. Uh, I have the eighth largest ag district in the country in terms of corn and soybean production, uh, heavy manufacturing base. And there is a lot of anxiety in both of those industries as we've heard today. Uh, Wall Street Journal uh, just came out with an article in the last couple months. The ag economy is down 13% over last year, directly related to tariffs, directly related to the trade war with China, and so a, a lot of stress and concern there. However, most of my constituents in my district support the president in going after China. And you mentioned at the beginning of your statement, uh, quote, technology is going to rule the future. And, and how we change the behavior with China is, seems to be the crux of what you're getting at with your negotiations. And historically, looking over the last 25 years, no president from Clinton to Bush to Obama has been able to do anything on this front, whether it's cyber uh, threats, uh, forced technology transfer, stealing intellectual property, we have not been able to change that behavior uh, to, to put China on the same playing field as every other industrialized country in the world. And that really seems to be what we're trying to get at. Um, and, and having said that, uh, you've talked a little bit about our leverage in, in this negotiating process. And, and as I look at what you're trying to do here, um, I, I'm wondering whether this is gonna be different in terms of what's, what's gonna be different this time in changing the behavior in China. And I'm gonna submit for the record 
This is an article from Reuters uh, within the last two months here, and the title is, China says U.S. accusations of unfair trade practices are groundless. And in there, the spokesman from China goes on to say that, um, says the U.S. side made groundless accusations, and China finds that totally unacceptable, and that's from their spokesperson, and I'll submit that for the record, Mr. Chairman. And, and I guess as we look at um, what you said earlier, how do we have structural change? How do we... Uh, get to a more laws-based system, and I know that's, that's what you're getting at. So, so two questions, uh, Mr. Ambassador. First of all, on the ag side, um, as we begin planting season for our farmers, what assurances can you give my corn and soybean farmers and pork producers that the market share in China will be there when we resolve this eventually? And then secondly, um, as we look at this different approach that you're taking, um, what gives you confidence that this approach is going to be different, and what if it's not? What are the consequences to China if we're not able to hold them accountable uh, moving forward and changing that bad behavior? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Congressman, for that question. It covered a lot of territory, and I have one minute now to respond, <laughs> but I'll do it as quickly as I can. First of all, in terms of the, the soy uh, and corn, we are trying to, number one, get get more sales, more purchases, not in the question of corn, it's also in the question of, al of ethanol, yep. which of course is a huge uh, uh, user of corn products, or of, 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 of corn. So uh, I believe if we have a deal, there'll be a substantial, we, in the case of soy, we've already seen a substantial amount of additional purchases recently, and we've seen a certain um, um, moving together of soy prices back to traditional levels in terms of the um, uh, foreign competition. So we've, we've seen some impact, particularly with the, the most recent 10 million metric ton purchases that the Chinese have gotten into the market for. So if we have a deal, I, I think we will, you know, we will see substantial new sales there and hopefully some, some other improvements in terms of SPS stuff. How is this different? You know, we're, it has to be enforceable. It's got to be specific. And we're covering many more areas than anyone's ever, ever covered. But it requires the grit and determination of the president, and it really requires the cooperation of people who want to reform in China, and there are people in that. And, and the alternative is what's been going on, and that for sure fails. So we know that approach doesn't fail, and hopefully ours will, will succeed. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Schneider, to inquire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ambassador. Thank you again, not just for your time here today, but the availability you have given us uh, throughout this whole, whole process. Uh, being from Illinois, I share the concerns of my colleague for our farmers in our state. I represent uh, the suburbs of Chicago and uh, just want to share a, a quick story of a constituent, firsthand experience with some of China's bad practices. Uh, they were working on uh, some product designs, trying to get some samples. Uh, company in China was delaying and ultimately the, the, the company in, in my district started seeing their products showing up on shelves here in the United States, a clear theft of, of intellectual property. And this is something that's happening throughout the country. It's happening for businesses large and small. So I agree with you that China is a bad actor and that we can't let their devious behavior go unchecked. We need to level the playing field for American businesses in a level field our businesses can absolutely succeed. But I have real concerns with the way the administration has approached the problem, creating and escalating a trade war that's caused harm to many businesses and many businesses uh, throughout my district. Uh, last summer, I visited a number of companies to talk about the impact tariffs were having on them, and everyone was uh, very concerned that it was hurting their ability to compete. But it's not just businesses. A local school district in, in my district had to spend $2 million in contingency funding uh, to cover the increased cost in materials for a, a remodeling project. So I was pleased to hear that you've made progress in the discussions and the March deadline uh, was delayed. In your testimony, you mentioned that this administration is pressing for significant structural changes to allow for that more level playing field. What specific structural reforms or other policies are you pursuing in these negotiations to help our businesses that are experiencing hardships in the Chinese market? And can you ensure me that these reforms will be not just meaningful, but long lasting and that they're uh, looking towards the long term? And can you please share with the committee what outcomes you've secured thus far to help businesses like my constituent and those throughout the country that have been harmed by these Chinese companies? Well, thank you, Congressman. I would say, first of all, your example of intellectual property theft, and you heard it from your constituents, I've gotten many, many more. We could sit down and exchange stories at some point. 
Um, and that's a pattern that has to change, right? If that is real people losing money, losing um, market share, not only overseas and in China, but actually in the United States, right? I mean, they literally are competing against people that have sold the stuff in the United States. And um, so we are making headway. People say, well, tariffs are a blunt instrument, and my response always is, but we don't have any other instrument, right? If Congress wants to sit down and talk to me and worry about creating new tools, I'm happy to do that. I'd love to do it. We're using the tools we have. We know that just sitting around lathering hasn't worked for 25 or 30 years, so we have to try something new, and I think we've gotten to a point where we might have success. We'll find out. Hopefully, we'll have success. How will it be long-lasting? We'll see. The reality is this is going to be a challenge. It goes on for a long, long time. Um, my guess is it goes on long after I've left, and hopefully by the time you're sitting in the chair, you'll be sitting there making sure that the people who are in my job are doing, are, are continuing to do that, because enforcement tends to be about people, and if we're not going to enforce this agreement, they'll figure it out pretty quickly, and that'll be the end of it. What all we can do is try to set up a situation where we have the potential that if people go in here and have the right attitude, the tools will be there that they can be successful, and that's what our objective is. Okay. And, and we're using the tools that Congress has given us as imaginatively, I've told one of your colleagues, as imaginatively as possible. When I testified in 2010, I thought we have to have imagination. I think that's what the president has shown here, imagination and then grit, right? If I can uh, use my, my last couple of seconds to emphasize something else that you said as well. So thank you for that. You mentioned that uh, technology is our biggest asset, and we have to protect that intellectual property, that technology. But it's more than that. It's the application of that technology in this country. It's the continued innovation to think about the next technology, and it's the alliances we build uh, around the world to, to apply those. So I appreciate that. With my time up, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, with that, let me recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Sawazi, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador, thank you so much for your public service. We really do appreciate the hard work that you do on behalf of the country. For decades, since President Nixon and Secretary Kissinger, and certainly since the end of the Cold War, the U.S. has operated under the assumption that with increased economic integration and exposure to our system of capitalism and democracy, that China would ultimately adopt some of our systems, at least in part. That simply hasn't happened. Not only has communist China eschewed democracy and engaged in awful human rights abuses, repression and abuse of religious minorities, such as the Uyghurs and the Tibetan Buddhists. Not only have they polluted the air, the land, and the water and treated their workers poorly, but they've not transitioned to capitalism or a market economy. The Chinese state communist government not only cheats by stealing intellectual property, restricting access to their markets, but the Chinese government subsidizes its industry. The 2019 Fortune Global 500 includes 111 Chinese companies, of which 78 of those companies are viewed to be 50% or more owned by the state. Could you share with us your sense of what the long-term policy of the United States is and the goals that you have as part of this negotiation to have long-term structural change on this relationship? Thank you. Thank you for that question. That's a, a great opportunity, and all of your colleagues are saying, I hope Lighthizer is unusually short-winded. I would say this, you, you, you raised the fundamental question. There was a myth that grew up, and if you look at my 2010 testimony, which, which I think is really quite good testimony, it's been referred to on several occasions here today and in the past, the myth was that if you open up a market, if you have uh, a, a, an economy, you will become democratic, small d democratic. That is the myth. You'll open up that, that that will lead to an open economy and to an open political system, and all of a sudden we're all a, a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, people from where, from Ohio, where I'm from, right? That's the myth. And the reality, and that was literally professed by all the smart people, all the clever people, uh, and that really is what led us to to really to PNTR, and it's precisely what I read. You weren't here, I read the speaker's quote, which was very prescient, saying this ain't so. And she said it, and she was right. And all those smart people were wrong. Um, the reality is that it doesn't. You can have a very good economy and not have any freedom, or have very little freedom, right? You can, there's a, we, we made this up, well I didn't, but assumptions were made that were incorrect. So I. I completely agree, and your, the tone of your remarks 
where, without saying every specific part of it, are, are why we have a bipartisan view on this and why we're making success. It's because of people like you that we have success. If this was a partisan thing, it wouldn't be. The fact that it's bipartisan is why we're making success on this. So what's the goals of this negotiation specifically to try and have long-term structural impact? And will we ever get to a place where we think that China represents something closer to what our system of capitalism is? Not, I'm not gonna put democracy on your, on your yeah. shoulders too. So, so I would say on the second one, you know, we'll find out. You're younger than I am. You're more likely to have a better view, right? Because you'll get there and, and see it. I don't, I, I don't know what our objectives are. Our objectives are to, to, to foster reform in China, which there's a group of people that want to do, to lead to structural reforms on the kinds of things where we can within the confines of the, con, confines of the statute that you've given us and the report that we did. Here's our report and here's our, if you haven't seen it, and here's our supplement and it's, if, if well, we can't get to the whole report in the last three seconds I have left, so I, I, I'm going to take you up on your offer to try and work with you to see if there are other tools the Congress can help to give you and people like you to be more effective in the future. Thank Fantastic. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for being here. You know, part of what we do, we get a chance to go around our district and, uh, and talk to people when we're, we're back home doing our district work weeks. And, and last summer, I stopped in a place in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, called Blair Steel. Blair Steel got started in the late 1800s when Pittsburgh was known as the Iron City, uh, before steel became the product of choice and how, how, how it took off. So I asked uh, Mr. Kenny, I said, Mr. Kenny, looking at what's going on right now, what could we have done differently? And he looked at me and said, I'll tell you what we could have done differently. We should have elected this guy 39 years ago. Now, people say, oh, no, 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 that's exactly what happened because we have taken a back seat and somehow we think that if we're just nice, other people will play by the rules. I think Mr. Swazi is right on top of this. A lot of my colleagues have said the same thing. We have to be damn fools if we don't think we haven't been in a trade war for decades and we're afraid of a trade war today that's already taken place and has had taken heavy casualties. We just never stood up to it to say, hey, you're taking advantage of us. But we're so damn nice, we're not going to call you out on it. Other than what you're doing right now, and I mean this sincerely, because you said maybe Congress could help out. This administration and your tireless efforts to make sure that everybody's playing for the role. I am so damn tired of forfeiting the game and then crying because we lost. This is absolutely stupid. We have allowed ourselves to get into this position. What could we do differently? And I want to tell you, I think most of it is stand 100% behind this administration and don't let these people get away with what they've been getting away from for so many years. An old saying, and this is very crude, but there's an old saying out there, if you're in a peeing contest with a skunk, the only way to beat him is to out pee him. I gotta tell you right now, I think we are in a trade war that has taken a heavy toll across the United States, and we sit back and we just don't wanna offend anybody. I am so offended by us not being offensive that it is it's sickening what will be allowed to happen to manufacturing and intellectual properties, and you name it, we've been game so badly for so long. Anything else we can do to help you, Mr. Ambassador? Mr. Ambassador? Well, well let me say, first of all, I, it, it really is important, and I, I've said this, this is my theme, well, it's been my theme for two years, that these things have to be bipartisan. They cannot be partisan. This is just different than a lot of other stuff we deal with. And, and, and hearing the last two questions shows why exactly it is bipartisan, right? Why this is a fundamental, both intellectual and gut reaction to what is going on. And I think supporting us, supporting the president, when we get this, this package together, if there is a package, and I'm not there yet, as I say all the time, um, that we have to look at it and get behind it and, and say this is a great step forward, but you have to stay, you know, you have to keep your, 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 uh, uh, your eye on making sure that, that, that we enforce it and that I enforce it and that my successors enforce it and, and that, in, you know, years down the road that new presidents enforce it. So, and then the second thing I would suggest, what I, which I've said before, I'd love to work with members on new tools. I think we need new tools. Yeah. I, I won't go through it here because, but the, the, what's happened to 301 is, is troubling, right? So, and I don't want to go through all Yeah, just because that. we talk about 232 and 301, I got to tell you, when I go back home in Western Pennsylvania, people don't look at me and say, let me, t tell me exactly what's in 232 or tell me what's happening with 301. 
That goes back to 1974, and the reason we did it is because of unfair, unreasonable, discriminatory trade policy practices, right? So these are things that Congress created for the President of the United States, the executive branch, to handle for us. I believe it's going to take eternal vigilance. I think that what you said earlier, our trade agreements are like children. They last as long as they last. We're in grave danger, I think, in this country of thinking that somehow people will play fair with us because we're nice as opposed to being vigilant. Thank you so much for your time and your effort. I know you don't sleep very often because we've talked before. You're doing one hell of a job. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Brady, and of course, Ambassador Lighthizer. Thank you very much for being here. I think uh, in the 116th, just on the Ways and Means Committee alone, you've been here uh, three times uh, within the last two months, and I think that says a lot about you and your commitment to working with us, and we look forward to continuing to work with you, not just on this, but of course, the USMCA as well. Uh, that, uh, as well as trade with China, is very important to me and my district uh, there in California. As you know well, California is the number one ag producing state in the nation, although I appreciate the questions from my other uh, members here on the dais. Uh, California is uh, what it's about when it comes to agriculture in the central coast of California, being the salad bowl of the world uh, is what it's about when it comes to being agriculture, and it contributes to that title that we are the number one ag producing state. Uh, but obviously, uh, these tariffs, these retaliatory tariffs, have affected uh, our farmers. Uh, you have over 800 food and agriculture products that are being, uh, that are being taxed. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of those products can be obtained from other non-U.S. trading partners. And so what we are seeing is a closing of certain markets. Now, I appreciate the fact that uh, there is an aid package of $12 billion, and I actually spoke with some of my almond growers uh, yesterday who were benefiting from that. But I can tell you, and what we've heard and what you've heard, I'm sure, it's not about aid, it's about trade. And it's not about uh, short-term bailouts, it's about long-term business. And so my question to you is, in regards to these markets that are potentially being shut off, that are, that are, that are, that are being closed, what are we doing to recoup those markets uh, in regards to your negotiations with China? You know, well, thank you, Congressman. First of all, the, 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 the problem on retaliatory tariffs and market opening goes beyond China. I should say that. And one of the things we're doing is we're having negotiations in a variety of areas. We're at a bit of a stalemate with Europe right now because they won't include agriculture. We want to include. We have our talks with Japan, which have a very big agriculture component. We have USMCA and the 232, and I, I'm looking forward to working with you on passing USMCA because it's so important for California. And, California and Illinois and everyone else. So I'm working for now. Now, in terms of of China, which is which unfortunately is only smart of the part of where we've had retaliatory tariffs. If we get an agreement, those tariffs will come off, and then the president's hope is, although it's not the purpose of the negotiation, that the purchases will have the effect of not only giving short-term sales. And by the way, we're looking at numbers that go out several years. We're not like, it's not like I should make this point, even the, within the purchases, which I, re, contrary to what's in the newspaper, is not the function, the purpose of this. Those purchases are going to have um, targets and amounts that go out for several years. But our hope is that if you increase those agriculture sales and you do it for a period of years, you will create new customers that will have uh, um, um, results that go on years and years and years and years into the future. So this is a it's a very real thing that the president's worried about. Obviously, when you get into a situation where you're trying to, to bring change about, it's going to have costs. No one has been more you know, you know, treated um, um, less fairly than the farmers, right? I mean, they, they are in a position where they should have enormous markets in, in, in China. China's a big market for us. As I say, they're our second or third, uh, depending on the year market, um, excluding, of course, 2018. But, but there's a much bigger market there. I mean, there's a lot of people there, and, and, and with any kind of fair trade, farmers would be beneficiaries, too. Thank you for bringing that understanding into these negotiations. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We will now revert to one for one on both sides. And with that, the chair would recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Reed. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Ambassador, it's always great to, to be with you. And uh, I really do echo what my colleagues uh, have said about you. I think you're the right person at the right time to take on this uh, much needed uh, negotiation with China. Uh, one of the things I want to bring to your attention is, and maybe your thoughts on as well as my colleagues to, to focus on a little bit as we deal with these tariffs and the future after we negotiate uh, this agreement. I do believe we're going to be able to negotiate agreement and you have one chance, very limited runway, to do this right, to make a fundamental shift in our trade relationship with China. But, you know, one of the things I see, and I, and I see the Chinese position, you know, they're thinking long term. They're always thinking long term. They're not looking transactional. And so as I see the negotiations uh, proceed and the tariffs that are on the books and uh, reaction in China, I see their commitment as a co-chair of the U.S. Manufacturing Caucus to build up excess capacity. And I'll add another issue to it, excess inventory of certain products so that when that new marketplace is created, what are we going to do to protect America markets uh, from that excess capacity and inventory that would then be dumped or thrown into the U.S. market in a very uh, dangerous uh, 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 way, in my opinion. Uh, do you understand what I'm getting to? Because as I see manufacturers, as I see folks, especially at advanced manufacturing, uh, I see China reacting to this transaction of what we're dealing with with the, these negotiations. But as these tariffs come off, as, these, uh, as we uh, operate under this new agreement, how are we going to minimize the adverse potential impact of what the Chinese 2025 long-term vision of positioning us, positioning them as a world leader in manufacturing to protect uh, our ma manufacturing uh, bases here in domestic soil. Let me ask just, thank you for that question, Congress. That's a fundamental question. I want to make one point clearly, and that is, I think the United States has been guilty of short-term thinking and short-term view for sure, but I don't think that's true of President Trump. President Trump, that's why he's going after structural Amen. changes. He is looking down the road. He's thinking he wants to know what's going on way down the road and have the United States still have this advantage. We have to be number one. We just have to stay number one. And by the way, most people in the world want us to be number one, right? I, mean, I totally agree with you. So what are you going to do when that valve is, is potentially open up? Are there going to be strict enforcement mechanisms? So to you have to have strict sure enforcement. Let's remember, no matter what happens, we have to maintain strong laws if it's unfair trade. We have to remain strong on any dumping laws, strong counter of any duty laws. So if that inventory is dumped on the U.S. market, uh, what are we going to do to make sure that that uh, uh, that enforcement is there and easily executable by us to take on that Chinese action. So, number one, we have in here provisions, if it's agreed to, that will limit um, subsidies specifically in cases of so-called competitive industries, that is to say where there is this problem of excess capacity. What you're talking about is what's happened in steel, what's happened in aluminum, what's happened in solar panels, what's happened in Christ, what Advanced machines. manufacturing. Well, on, manufacturing on, 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 on. Yep. There is an agreement to limit subsidies in those kinds of cases. There are unfair trade laws, and then there's the enforcement provisions in here. This is a pattern. And by the way, it's not always even a plan. Sometimes it's just they start this, and, and the, the provincial governments and the local governments all kind of get into it, and, and, and they don't have a way even to put their own brakes on, right? Well, so do we at least agree that that potential threat is there? Uh, that, well, I'm, I, that I'm raising. I absolutely think it's there. It, and, I mean, and we wanna, and we it's undeniable put, that it's there. And we want to put enforcement mechanisms readily available to us as, as, uh, as partners in this agreement that we can then deploy against China. We may need to make it very clear, I think, to China that we're ready to use those. Is that fair to say? Yeah, ab absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Murphy, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ambassador, uh, presumably the goal of uh, Section 301 tariffs is to cause China enough economic pain to perse persuade China's leadership to negotiate an enforceable agreement curtailing its abusive trade practices. And in a previous answer, you noted yourself that tariffs are a blunt instrument. You know, not only are they not precision guided, um, they can uh, have unintended consequences often for U.S. consumers and small businesses. And I imagine that before you made the unilateral decision to impose tariffs on China, you weighed the cost and benefits and designed those uh, tariffs to maximize the damage to China and minimize the self-inflicted damage to companies and consumers in the U.S. and to the broader American economy. Whatever your intentions were, I, 
I have, um, I have to tell you the evidence on the ground is really grim. Um, I've had small business owners in my community um, in Central Florida break down when they talk to me about the impact the tariffs are having on the companies that they have spent a lifetime building and on the workers that they view more like family than they do employees. Uh, for example, David, he's the owner of a 30-person electronics firm in Orlando that imports components from China and sells finished products to American retailers. His biz business has been upended by this, this third tranche of 10% tariffs that took effect on September 24th. When he went to work that day, he had to pay an upfront bill of $280,000 to release his goods from China um, from, that had already landed at a U.S. port. No notice from his government, no time to adjust, and since September, David has paid over $800,000 in tariffs. It's a lot of money for a small business. Um, so what he's had to do is raise the cost of his products. Uh, some of the big retailers have agreed to pay more, but they're just passing those costs on to uh, consumers. And some smaller retailers just simply won't accept the price increase, and so that means that David has lost business. These tariffs have decimated his cash flow, uh, jeopardized his financing, and made him unprofitable, placing his workers' jobs, my constituents' jobs, at risk. And unlike his bigger competitors, David doesn't always have ways to mitigate the harm. So if this 10% tariff endures, the damage could be really severe. And if it increases to 25%, the damage could be fatal. Uh, in 40 years as a business owner, he tells me he's never seen government actions interfere so directly with his businesses. And I know you're not insensitive to this um, issue, but what, what do I tell these small business owners like David whose livelihoods are on the line? When is this going to end? What will their sacrifices have allowed you to achieve? And do you think you're going to be willing to accept a deal that falls short of what you've, indi uh, you've indicated you wanted to achieve in order to end this trade war? So, um, y y first of all, we are sympathetic to situations like uh, uh, David's, although I don't purport to know the details of it. Um, but there clearly are people who import products who are who are negatively affected. Um, I, I would suggest that this is a 10% tariff, and that with the depreciation of the Chinese currency, it's probably having a four or five percent, maybe less, maybe two or three percent effect on his business. So, I just would make that statement. In terms of notice, of course, you know that this we go through a notice and comment process. This process of putting these these tariffs in place was months going through with hearings and all the. And so I don't want to let anybody have the impression that this is something that just we woke up and did this. No, there are laws and we followed them and there were months and months and months and months and months of uh, a process going through here. Uh, I always start with the proposition of do you think we have a problem with China? If you don't think we have one, then all of this is crazy. If you think we have a, China, a problem with China, then we have to weigh what is necessary to move forward. And in terms of what we're willing to accept, no, I don't think we should accept anything that doesn't have structural changes and is enforceable. Absolutely not. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Rice, to inquire. Ambassador Lighthizer, thank you so much for being here. I have told you repeatedly that one of the things that gives me the greatest confidence in this administration is people like you and uh, Secretary Ross that have taken on these jobs to lift up American workers, heartened by your observation uh, about the loss of the five million jobs since China entered the WTO and your objective in taking this job and doing something about that and lifting up our middle class. Because you see, I believe that our middle class, our, that American workers can compete with anybody in the world on a level playing field and that we here in Washington have allowed that playing field to be tilted against them for far too long. Uh, beginning around 1990, we were competitive at that time in the world, but we sat on our hands and allowed everybody else to change their economic systems, including their tax system, regulatory structure, trade policies, and so forth, to take advantage of American workers. And 30 years ago, we could accept trade agreements that weren't necessarily uh, in our favor. We were so far ahead of the rest of the world, but we can't do that anymore. So I'm really proud of what the President's done, restructuring our tax code, uh, restructuring our regulatory system, and I think the next most important thing we can do is to balance our trade agreements. Your progress on NAFTA is so important and so impressive. 
your pro progress with China it gives us great hope, although I heard you say at least a dozen times today that it's not done yet. Uh, but I just want to applaud you on how far we've come because I don't think there's anything more important at this point after tax reform, after regulatory reform, that we can use to make our economy competitive and allow our workers to compete on a level playing field. Once we get through this, we need to move on to infrastructure. I want to tell you that I had a town hall in Loris, South Carolina last week, and a group of farmers came to my little town hall in Loris, and they're worried. They grow peanuts and tobacco and cotton and soybeans primarily, and they said to me, you know, we're worried about this disruption with China. It's certainly affecting our business. What can we expect? When can we expect? You know, how quickly is it going to be resolved? And we talked about all that. And I promised them that I would raise these issues to you here in this hearing. So they're watching you right now. Hello, everybody back home. But that being said, when we got through, they also asked me to tell you that they're behind you. And they're rooting for this president. And they recognize that this has to be done. And they recognize how important it is. So in my last minute, I'm going to turn it over to you. And I am going to uh, ask you to tell my farmers back home as best you can what they can expect. Well, you know, thank you very much, Congressman. And, and thank you for your comments about me. I, I'm, I'm grateful for that. I, I would just make the obvious statement, and that is that, like other members in my position, people in my position, we are inspired by and empowered entirely by the president. If it wasn't for the president, I'd have no power and no inspiration. So I'm happy to have this opportunity to be able to, to at least fight for the things that we all care about. And so we'll see how that turns out. I would say to, to, to these uh, farmers, I think that they have been victims uh, as much as anybody in America, what goes on in China. And, and I think they, have the, the, they are more vulnerable than a lot of other people for a whole variety of reasons that we all know about. And that if we have an agreement, there's a likelihood that, that we'll begin the process of the payoff. Once again, if we don't enforce and we don't keep on it, it's not going to happen. Fortunately, we're not in a world where just good things happen automatically, right? So if we do our job and if we get an agreement, I think there's going to be a good payoff for them. And the president is very grateful for their support. He understands exactly that these are real people putting it on the line for him. So thank you. We thank the gentleman. And with that, let me recognize the gentleman from Nevada to inquire, Mr. Horsford. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and to the ranking member for this opportunity and the hearing. I appreciate, uh, Mr. Ambassador, that though these negotiations have been ongoing and fraught, uh, that our Congressional Committee is uh, finally getting an opportunity to address concerns that we've heard from our constituents about and that directly impact uh, each of our districts. So I wanted to uh, first say, Mr. Ambassador, we want you to be successful. On behalf of the American worker, the American uh, business owner, um, uh, the am American consumer, all of whom are depending upon uh, the successful outcome of your negotiations. I wanted to share with you uh, that in Nevada, it's estimated that $107 million worth of exports are threatened by new tariffs. Nevada's exports to China total $28.7 million. And these exports affect an estimated 367,000 jobs in Nevada. As the price of steel rises, so does the construction cost across our state. There is currently an estimated $25 billion of planned, proposed, and currently under construction major projects in Southern Nevada. Projects like the Raider Stadium, the Las Vegas Convention Center expansion, and public projects, including expansion at our uh, universities, all have become more expensive. Food is also a big component of exports threatened by the U.S.-China trade deal. Uh, everything from food, bread, pastries, condiments, and even milk. So companies that make everything from metal castings to appliances to the dairy sector and even bakeries are impacted. And since last March, the administration embarked on a series of tariff actions that retaliation from trading partners. 
And I know that, Mr. Ambassador, uh, you have talked about um, the need to focus on enforcement and structural changes as part of this process. Uh, but what hope and, and relief can we give to our constituents about some of these pressing uh, impacts that we see right now uh, based on this ongoing trade war with China? Well, well, thank you, Congressman. I would say, first of all, in these circumstances, one has to begin the analysis, as I said a minute ago, why is there a problem, right? And if you believe there is a problem where we are right now between the United States and, and China, and that that problem threatens our future and our kids' children's future and all of those people who we are very concerned about and who are adversely affected, if you don't believe those people are potentially very seriously affected unless we change policies there, then there's no point in this. But if you do think those people's futures are threatened, then you have to go through this process. And our objective has been to try to minimize the effect. Uh, as the Congress lady said, we have to minimize our effect um, on, on our own consumers and maximize the effect on others, and we try to go through that process. But when we get out the other end, we have to be in a position where we have actually defended our workers and our farmers and our ranchers, and we have the potential for, for um, structural change in, in China. And, and um, I think we've done a reasonably good job of minimizing that effect on our own consumers. That isn't to say that individuals aren't particularly affected I, substantially, and we have an exclusion process to try to help that out. So we're, we're sympathetic and focused on it. In terms of the steel, I would just say generally, I want to get a steel agreement. The president wants me to get some kind of a steel agreement, if I can, with Canada and Mexico. I think that will you know, alleviate some of that problem. And Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield Thank back. the gentleman. And with that, let me recognize the gentlelady from Alabama, Ms. Sewell, to inquire. Last but not least. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was also want to thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for being here today. This discussion is long overdue. In fact, since the last time you publicly appeared before the Ways and Means Committee, this administration has imposed a 25% tariff on 50 billion of imports from China and another 10% tariff on 200 billion of Chinese imports. Uh, the Chinese predictably retaliated with a tariff of 100 billion on U.S. exports. We are all aware of China's unfair trade practices, and you're right, the fundamental question is um, not just do we believe there's a problem with China and trading? We do. I think universally all of us will agree with that. I think the more fundamental question is what do we do about it? I think that it's important that we do something about it, but I can also tell you that uh, the tariffs have had a really uh, uh, devastating effect on the folks back home in Alabama. In fact, I have three concerns about um, the 301 uh, tariffs as enforcement mechanisms. First, um, it is a, our alliances and created a multilateral pressure on China and probably been a little bit more effective quicker. Um, secondly, when, uh, while we in Alabama do believe that trade works for us, we, we really believe that uh, retaliatory tariffs don't. And um, the retaliation that, that, that has the most impact on my district has been both with farmers as well as with my manufacturers. China has been uh, the forest industry in my district is suffering from a 25% um, tariff on southern pine logs and a 10% tariff on uh, soft, the softwood lumber. So I guess my question really is one of a fundamental belief that while there is definitely a problem, a trade problem with uh, China, is the, the enforceability of tariffs the way we're doing them the best way to get at that problem? So my question is, um, especially given the fact that we're looking for Section um, 301 tariffs as a tool to enforce other trade agreements, my question to you really is, do you see Section 301 tariffs as an enforcement tool of last resort when all of our options have be, been exhausted, or do you see it as a weapon that can be deployed regularly to uh, exert concessions from um, other economic rivals and allies? Well, I would say, first of all, I don't want to conflate tariffs with other tariffs, right? Because, I mean, as you know well, there's the softwood lumber, that's a litigation yep. matter brought by private people. The steel and aluminum is something entirely different, in, in my opinion. I think 301 is an effective tool. I think we should be working with members to find more effective tools. And I can 
At some point, I want to sit down and take you through the history of 301. Sometime when you're just like ready to go to sleep and you can't get to sleep, I'll take you through it and go ahead because it's kind of an Since interesting. Since I sit on the Intel Committee too, yeah. many sleepless nights for me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's right. Um, so th there's a history there. I think we need better tools. But in terms of whether or not we should have done what we did or, or did a multilateral approach, I honestly believe that good people tried for 20 years the multilateral approach and the talk approach and the let's all go along, get along approach. And I can tell you, at, at some point, I'll, sh I'll show you, I brought along, I have a chart here that sort of shows the trade deficit with every one of these go along and get along. There it is right there. So, so here's the trade deficit and here's every one of these go along joint things. It, they just demonstrably failed. And when you're in a situation where something really, really matters in our kids' lives, you know, jobs depend on it, and you've tried something and it's failed, failed, failed for 20 years, you'd have to be crazy in my judgment not to try something else. Now, is this perfect? I'm not gonna say it's perfect, but it at least is leading to results where everything else didn't. Now, I just wanna say thank you for allowing um, the ambassador to complete his answer. And I just really wanna just say in closing, we're all, really, really, uh, your success is our success. We do want um, to get a better balance when it comes to trade with China. And um, I wanna thank you for being open enough to come and talk to us on a regular basis with respect to, uh, to these tariffs and the trade agreements. We thank the gentlelady and we will conclude with the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ambassador. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, you know, it's been fascinating sitting here and listening to both sides recognize a few common threads here. Number one, China has been, has, you know, has been participating in un unfair practices for years, and it has hurt American business, it has hurt American innovation, and most importantly, it's hurt the American worker. Consistently, I hear throughout my district the support for these efforts to really put China into a new trading position with the U.S. Across the board, whether it's Republican or Democrat, small business, large business, they all understand the need to do this and they also understand the need that, because we have not done it in the past, that there is going to be a rough transition period while this fight takes place, but it will be worth it in the end. So I wanna commend you and the administration for fighting so, so hard on behalf of the American worker. You know, it, as, as I look at this, another thing that uh, is we recognize this, um, and I've heard a couple of comments along these lines, talking about the context of the China deal and the, with, with everything else that's going on in trade. Could you speak, because we all recognize the problem with China, and we all recognize that it's a very large problem to deal with. Um, can you speak to the importance of getting the USMCA deal done on, on the heels of the South Korean deal and then bringing Japan into the fold and, and then moving to the Europeans. Can you speak to how important it is that we all develop these trade, trade deals so that we can collectively work to change the Chinese behavior? Well, you know, thank you very much, Congressman. Thank you for your comments about, about the, you know, the president's program, which I think is working and I'm, certainly going to pass along to him the various comments people have made about about what we're trying to do but 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 you are right and I said this at one point and I'll say it again there is no trade program in the United States if we don't pass USMCA there just isn't one what it says is that we don't have a consensus and that we don't want to stand up for our workers and our farmers and our ranchers I think there's no less than that at stake we have an agreement. It's clearly better than its predecessor. There's no question. It's $1.3 trillion worth of business. Millions and millions of people are affected, and it just have to pass. If it doesn't, you have no credibility at all with, with China, and you will have no credibility on any deals with your other trading partners. I have members come to me as I talk. I tell you, every day I talk to two or three members, just literally every day, and, they, and they're all, it's always constructive in this, and they have ideas, and they have thoughts, and all this, and I always in the back of my head think, if we don't pass USMCA, just don't bother. Just sit down and just say, we'll just wait a few years before we say anything. I want to thank you for, for that and addressing that, but I, I want to switch gears for just a minute. Um, my, in my hometown, we have, we have an automaker there, Kia Motors, Kia Motors Manufacturing, Georgia. We have seen the benefits of having a good trade agreement uh, with, with South Korea. Um, we want to continue to see that. 
one concern that I have, and, and if you could address it very quickly, the timelines both on the USMCA and poten potentially any trade deal, three to five years for implementation. Talk about how that, that, that to me seems like a relatively tight timeline. Is there opportunity um, if companies are moving in the right direction to, to give some leeway as they try to bring jobs back to, back to America? Could you hit? USMCA requires uh, a, a very short transition. They can get the additional two years if, they're, if they are meeting certain uh, requirements. We've worked with the, with the manufacturers. Is it a tight time frame? Yes. Is it a doable time frame? Yes. We have to make changes as soon as we can. By, by extending this out, I mean, we have consensus among manufacturers, and by extending it out, you're just postponing new Americans getting their new jobs, and I don't want to do that. We want these people to be employed as soon as possible. So this is a doable thing, and by the way, we want them in, in, to be manufacturing more engines and more transmissions in Georgia, and I think they're going to, and they're going to quit using the Korean engines and transitions, transmissions to 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 a large extent. So this is going to be a big win for you, but, but I don't want to defend them. I already pushed it off as far as I'm going to push it off. Who knows where I'm going to be in five years. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, let me thank you for joining us today. As always, your accessibility is appreciated by the committee. Please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. And with that, the committee stands adjourned. Thanks, Kevin.